Welcome to the 2024 F1 Sim Racing World Championship and welcome to Event 2. I'm Ariana Bravo and I'm so excited to get things underway. Event 2 covers six races in three days, starting with a first time visit to the fastest street circuit in the world, Jeddah, and then a return to Spielberg. Event 1 delivered action, excitement and a dominant win for Thomas Ronha. Let's have a little look back at how things unfolded. The F1 Sim Racing World Championship is underway. Five drivers will be eliminated at the end of this session. Through Alvaro Caraton now crosses the line. Thomas oh. Runhart goes, he takes it! Thomas Runhart is on pole. Nothing is over until the lady sings. It's Runhart down towards turn one. Oh, and there's so, so close. close between the two of them. But this battle is not over yet. And then it's all oh, contact! Just really unfortunate. There's the move on Yano on me. Oh, Thomas Runhart, he goes down off the inside. That is F1 Sim Racing at its finest. You can hear them now. There's been one man and one man only. Thomas Ronhart wins the first race of the season. For the people who doubted in me, thank you for making me stronger to, you know, be a dominant driver and uh, win the race. What a result for Thomas Ronhart. It's, it's just unbelievable. In second position, Jarno Otmir finishes Nicholas Longay in third. And I need to take a lie down, Steph. Thomas Ronhar kicking things off in style. And with me to kick event two off in style are Hayden Gullis and George Morgan. Guys, lovely to have you both with us. How excited are you, Hayden? So excited. It's been a long winter, but we're mm -hmm. finally back and we are in a very hectic schedule. But a lot of racing, a lot of action. And I, for one, cannot wait to get started. I cannot wait either. We love a bit of chaos. We love a bit of action. George, how are you feeling? Buzzing. I, I think for we, we can all agree, uh, first of all, it's great to be back live. And, and I think at the same time, look at this fabulous stage. Yep. Uh, I mean, truly, this is where eSports belongs. It is indeed. And as you said, we've got a hectic mm -hmm. schedule, six races across three days. That's quite full on for the drivers, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how each team plays it individually because you want to motivate your driver who's still going to be in for the title fight, but that could potentially fatigue them. Whereas those teams who are possibly switching their, their drivers about across this event might have the upper hand. Indeed. Now, we were just mentioning Thomas Ronha, who, of course, won out in Bahrain. Dominant and also a little bit of a message for some of his doubters, maybe. <laughs> yeah, he came off the back of a difficult couple of years. And I must say, I, I think this is a real proving point, I think, for Thomas Ronha. He needed to send a clear message, I think, to everyone out there to say, listen, I am quick. I am here to win. He did just that. And didn't he just do it in style as well? I mean, he came off the back of last season, great run of form, was in championship contention in his debut year, very nearly pulled off a David Tanitza from 2019. But very close, but he started in the most perfect way possible. Victory at Bahrain. He did indeed, and that's got to put a spring in the step of the whole team, right? To come in and have such dominance in race one. Yeah, I'm loving the team dynamic over there at Kick. You've got Brendan Lee, the, the famous finger wag, and now we've had <laughs> Thomas Ronha, the, the shush to the crowd. So, but yeah, it's definitely going to spur them on. They're leading the championship, but it's very, very close between three teams, them, Ferrari, and, uh, and I believe Mercedes as well. So it's very close. We're only one race in. It's a hectic schedule. It's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out over the next two events. And going back to that schedule, what do you reckon for that? Because I think that could work in favour of some of our drivers who are more experienced, more seasoned, whereas some of the rookies, that might be a little bit tough for. Yeah, I mean, if we take a look at league racing form at the moment, there's a lot of old drivers that are starting to come back into their own. I mean, I'm looking at guys like Danny Berejne mm -hmm. as well, who is very much, a, uh, you know, very much part of the furniture in F1 esports in many ways. Yoni Tormela, who has been here ever since the walls were put up uh, and Brendan Lee himself someone who has you know performed well over a very vigorous kind of format you know there, there was a lot of racing back in 2017 a very different style of championship to what we have now this week is really hectic a real tough tough circumstance for everyone included who's going to rise to the top 
Big question marks. Mm -hmm. Big question marks indeed. But these guys are all built for this. This is what they do, right? They know what they're doing here. We hopefully know what we're doing <laughs> here. It's going to be a lot of fun, but it is not just us, is it? We are also going to be joined by Claire Cottingham, who is lining up an exciting interview for you. We're just waiting for our guests to get ready. So before we get into that, let's talk about who she will be speaking with. Jano Otmir, second place finisher mm -hmm. in Bahrain. What do you reckon for him this time out in event two? Well, he's coming off the back of maybe a slightly more disappointing 2022 for himself, but got, you know, the upper hand. He's, yes, okay, he's not leading the championship, but he's still there in the mix and he's in the fight. And as you've said, he's had some really good form in the warm-up league racing, building up to this event. So hopefully he can bring that to this, but also has that experience. He's been here in a LAN event before, whereas Thomas has only done one race so far on a LAN event. So he's definitely going to have that upper hand. Let's talk a little bit about the LAN event. George, just give us a bit more information for people who may be tuning in for the first time to eSports. Give them a bit of an explanation about why it's such an important difference. It, well, it's huge because we haven't really had anything of the sort over the last few years. They've all been racing online. Of course, we had COVID period, which, you know, we, I think we can all agree. We're glad to be out of that, <laughs> I think, at this point. But, uh, you know, it, it just has a whole different atmosphere, I think. And the, and the drivers have to really get stuck in. And it's a whole different kind of pressure because you've got eyes on you people across the world, but also people in the room and other drivers you're up against. It's a very fraught environment, but certainly for guys that have done it time and time again, your Yana Watmeers, your Brendan Lees, in many ways, your Thomas Ronha, who won the pro exhibition. Mm. He's got experience in that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it galvanizes talent. And I think we're going to see that here this week. You mentioned uh, Yano and Brendan there. Two multiple world champions, but as we can see, it's been a little while since Brendan Lee has been able to lift the trophy 2017 and 2018, Jano Otmir 2020 and 2021. They're both going to be eager to get back on that top step this year, aren't they? Yeah, neither. Well, we've never had a three time world champion in F1 sim racing. So could we potentially see the first one? There's only two people who are able to fight for it. But then, of course, Lucas Blakely is going to be looking to try and put himself on the same level as Jano and Brendan to become a two time world champion. But it's going to be very interesting to see between those two. It is indeed. You mentioned Lucas Blakey there. What about Freddie Rasmussen, though? He's a name that keeps coming up. When's it going to happen? Is it going to be this year? What do you reckon, George? Oh, forever the bridesmaid, never the bride, eh? Oh. I'll tell you what, it really is. It, well, I mean, bone of contention for Freddie Rasmussen, really, that he has not won a title. And, yeah. and many would say that he is probably one of the most gifted, naturally talented sim racers on the planet. Uh, I think given what we've seen in history, uh, he carries such a staunch podium record, win, race wins record as well. He is furiously quick uh, and well worthy of his seat at Red Bull that he has held for so many years. Uh, this year could be his year, ironically, given the fact that we have such an intense environment. Six races in one single week might be at Freddy's Alley. It might be indeed. Right, let's take a little look at how things look after event one in Bahrain. Driver standings, Hayden, take us through it. Yeah, Thomas Ronhart leading the way, 25 points for the win, and then he got that extra point in Bahrain for pole position, a new point system for this season. Jano Otmer, though, hot on his heel in second. Nicholas Longay, a great performance for Ferrari in P3. It's also interesting to note that both Ferraris in the top five, Barry Borman there. Danny Berezny, a sort of return to form for him in these uh, LAN event style. He's always used to be one of the greatest drivers in these, in these LAN events. Kind of went under the radar a little bit when we went back home, but now he seems to be coming back to his fine form. Uh, but then also, some new names there. Ismail Fassi, Alf Alfie Butcher as well. Strong performances them from them on their debut. Further down the field, though, not a good race for McLaren. 11th and 12th at the moment in the driver's standings. And Brendan Lee as well, a former champion, down in 17th. Oh, indeed. Let's have a little look now, shall we, at the constructor's standings. And George, take it away. Yeah, the constructor standings looks a little bit like this. Kick F1 Sim Racing getting things off perfectly with Thomas Ronha taking the major points. Mercedes looking strong too. You can never discount Jana Watmir coming second with Jake Benham picking up necessary points as well. 26 points across the top three. Factor in Ferrari with their hugely strong lineup with Longay and Barry Burraman too. But also looking further down, McLaren Shadow. You're so right, Hayden. Blakely, the current champion, Wing damage back at Bahrain, which halted his chances of victory. He's got to come back fighting. Well, event two is when people will be looking to do that bounce back. As I mentioned, it is not just us three who are here. Claire Cottingham is out and about grabbing interviews for us, and she has managed to get hold of someone. Claire, who are you with? 
Well, as you mentioned, Ariana, we were going to speak to uh, Jano Otmir, but I don't know if you can see it, but the, all the drivers right, right now are still uh, practicing ahead of the qualifying session. So we thought we'd grab a team manager here, Samuel Lebert. Um, you are leading the championship at the moment. You must be pretty happy with how round one went. How's your preparations going ahead of this mammoth few days we've got? Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organization for bringing us back the championship after the, the hard time that we had. Uh, it feels really nice to be back on stage and to be around like all the teams. Uh, in terms of preparation, it has been a roller coaster, as you can imagine. Uh, the last few months and the last five weeks, in specifically, has been really tough. Uh, yeah, the drivers and engineers have been doing tons of practice, uh, analyzing a lot of data and doing tons of uh, race simulation to, be, to make sure that we are like prepared and uh, to continue what we started in even one, which is the only thing we care about, and that's the victory. And talk me through your lineup, because you've got a two-time world champion in Brendan Lee, and you've also got uh, Thomas Ronha, who won, uh, I mean, a dominant display, as we've been talking about on the desk, uh, you know, from pole position as well. How proud are you of, of both of your drivers? I mean, there is no words to describe what happened in the even one. Uh, Thomas did what he does the best, which is uh, winning. Uh, I know it's not been really easy for him in the last few months and the, in the past years, but I think he showed to everyone that he was uh, the best driver on the grid at the moment. And uh, I don't have to present Brandon. I mean, <laughs> two times world champion. I think he will show uh, to everyone this week that he's back at the top. I mean, half the time he presents himself. Brendan, how are you feeling? I feel great. Yeah. yeah, life is good. How was practice? It was actually really nice. Drove some laps, didn't hit a wall. Can't ask for more, to be honest. Didn't hit a wall at Jeddah. That's, that's pretty good. That's what we want to hear. Yeah, and to be honest, breakfast was nice. We had a nice drink and yeah, it was good. Great. Lovely to hear that. Obviously, Tom, Thomas Ronhar there as well. Just getting ready for this qualifying session, Ariana. Brendan looking... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Almost alarmingly calm <laughs> there. Um, that's that's what we love to see. Very great energy from him, looking ready to go. Now, everyone is interested in winning. And why are they interested in winning? Because we have a wonderful prize pool for the drivers, $750,000 up for grabs. Not for us, unfortunately, boys, but oh, for the ones who are putting in the hard work. But in order to get there, let's just run through how the points system works. Very similar to Formula One. Points awarded for the top 10 finishes, 25 points for first place, 18 for second, 15 for third, 12 for fourth, 10 for fifth. And then we make our way down to 10th place with one point for the 10th place finisher. Also get a point for the fastest lap, providing that you finish in the top 10. And unlike Formula One, a point for pole position. Every single point counts. Now let's have a little look at how our event two schedule lines up. Today, as I mentioned, Jeddah and Spielberg. We will have qualifying for both locations coming up very, very shortly. Our first trip to Jeddah. Seeing cars go flat out in Jeddah is something special. As Claire mentioned, don't hit the walls. Spielberg, one that's always very exciting as well. And then we have a few hour break until we head into the race later on this afternoon. Tomorrow, we will visit Silverstone and Spa. Same setup all week. Qualifying first up for both races and then the race later in the afternoon. And finally, Zandvoort and Austin on Friday. So, lots coming your way. Strap in, get comfortable, because it's going to be exciting. First two races, first two qualifying sessions, promise to deliver. And on that note, guys, it's time for you to take it away. I'm out of here. Well, thank you very much, Ariana Bravo. What a superstar she is, folks. And welcome to the Jetta Cordini circuit. It is going to be for the first time ever here on the F1 Sim Racing calendar. So I tell you what, a big question mark, a big mystery around this track, of course, making your way around this circuit, 27 corners. You've got three DRS detection zones, 6.174 kilometers, 3.836 miles. Architect, the great Carsten Tilke, son of the legendary Herman Tilke. See, the broke ground back in March, 
well, 2021, opening up on the 3rd of December 2021 to boot as well. Very fast paced, Hayden, very technical. What a place to come back racing. Jeddah, so many action zones heading down to the first corner. Great overtaking opportunity. And then you're winding yourself through that sector one. Don't run it over the track limits. Don't put it in the barrier. Then into sector two, there's again another DRS section that you can potentially look for an overtake, but it's very tricky to get it done in towards that left right chicane. And then going into the final corner, you might want to stick up the inside, but if you do, you're going to be running the risk of being overtaken back down the start finish straight. I for one, I'm really excited to see how this qualifying session is going to go because these drivers, the consistency is unbelievable from them. And that's what you're going to need around a circuit like this because it's so easy for an average player like myself to put it in the barrier, just make that one small error or run over some track limits. But for these guys, we're going to be seeing some incredible qualifying. We certainly will. Activity already underway in the pit lane and intermediate tires already making an appearance for Jana Watmir, who makes his way out onto Is the track. Is it raining? It, well, not quite, Hayden, but we can extrapolate the <laughs> yes. feeling behind this because obviously, as we know, without wasting a set of tires, mm -hmm. You can try your car out, make sure there's no issues. Yeah, I mean, th that's the thing of coming into a LAN event. Uh, you you want to make sure that all of your all of your technical aspects, your, your wheel, your pedals, they're all working uh, how you like them. But also, you don't want to waste a set of soft tyres. And unlike real life F1, you don't have teams that are lower down the field that have that at disadvantage to a Red Bull, for example. So they're going to be burning those soft tyres to try and get into Q1, uh, out of Q1, into Q2, or into Q3. Whereas for all these drivers, they have exactly the same car. So they're going out on intermediate tyres. So at the moment, not really too much is going to be happening, but it's always nice fun to see. I think, you know, personally, they should award a point for all the drivers, throw them out on intermediates, have a bit of fun with it and uh, see what happens. Well, we will certainly see where the times stack up. Obviously, we'll have to wait a little bit longer until Jarno uh, has moved on to, should we say, a soft compound attire. But uh, I mean, looking at Jarno's record, I mean, a two time champion of this series going back to 2020, where he first took it with the Alfa Romeo team, now, of course, known as Kick F1 uh, these days. And then he won his next one back to back with Mercedes in 2021. No champion has ever reclaimed the title after losing it. Both Brendan Lee and Jana Watmir currently leading the way in terms of championships claim two apiece, with one going to David Tanitza back in 2019, who separated the pair, and then last year's champion, Lucas Blakely, who I'm sure we'll be seeing again as well very soon too. But uh, nevertheless, 15 minutes and 30 to go, and Freddie Rasmussen is out on track, and someone, as we alluded to, Forever the bridesmaid, never the bride. How many times has he finished P2 in the championship, Hayden? It has truly been a difficult time for him, but now's the time to strike. Yeah, Freddie is an interesting character because I, I never feel like he's one of those that has that aspiration to be, oh, I have to be driver champion. Doesn't necessarily have that ego met like maybe some of the other drivers have, that he's always working for the team. I think we saw it famously, I can't remember the season off the top of my head. I think it might have been 2020, but he was in the title fight and he decided to step out of Brazil because one of his other drivers had done more practice there and it was better for the team because at the end of the day, that's where the prize pool, the majority of the prize pool is going to go. So the team's championship is so important, but then at the same time, those other drivers like your Jana Watmirs, your Thomas Ronhars, you need to kind of keep them across all the races, keep them motivated, something to aim for and fight for to get as many points for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You can just see as well as we're panning across the uh, the arena right now, the, uh, the drivers themselves just getting composed. A few of them out on laps, uh, most of them in the pits. You won't find many of them coming back out until the latter moments of qualifying. That's when the track is at optimal. And obviously the drivers will want to make sure they get it nicely rubbered in. Into the pits comes Longgate, not content with setting a lap on the inters. It's more about the technology as far as the drivers are concerned folks as we're now witnessing him make his way into his bay so no movements up at the front you can already see Yano has switched from the intermediates straight onto the softs yeah they're going to be getting on those soft tires and trying to when they're on their little outlaps they're going to be trying to get their tires up to temperature uh, fun little technique to get your tires up to temperature no point weaving in, uh, in F1 sim racing because all that's going to do is give you tire wear and then that's going to disadvantage you on your main lap so hold the brake hold the throttle, build up the brake temperature, and that's going to build up the um, the tire temperature on the carcass. And then when you get to the side of your lap, you're going to have your outside temperatures done as well. But yeah, nothing really too much going on at the moment. Just teams in the pits as they, they've done their sort of, you know, installation laps. Everything's working fine. Doesn't look like anybody's got any problems around the studio at the moment. And I'm going to be thinking around potentially 
The 9 minute 30 mark, that's where we're going to have a lot of action out on track. But let's see if anybody decides to go early. Well, stalemate at the moment in terms of what's happening in the arena, but McLaren seem to think something's funny. Uh, but they've got to bounce back very quickly. A very mm -hmm. tough first visit at Bahrain, but it certainly hasn't dampened their spirits. They're looking in really good form. Ulas Rajildrim uh, marking his debut season in F1 Esports after contesting in F1 Esports Challenges last season. Now in F1 Sim Racing as a professional with Haas F1 Esports alongside the great Alfie Butcher, who was dominant in F1 Esports Challenges that season too. What a lineup that is. A dark horse lineup, I would argue here, Hayden. A team that may not have yet proven themselves on the big stage, but they're capable. I think so. I mean, Alfie Butcher had a very impressive debut. Yes, okay, qualifying was better than his race, and the race is where the points are scored, but inexperience is something that you can't underlook. Uh, in F1 sim racing because, you know, he's had a best time in Vigang with the, the the handlebar moustache that he's just decided to Serge opt Gnabry, for. Serge Gnabry, as yeah, I called him. <laughs> for, for this event. But yeah, speaking about Alfie Butcher, I think the inexperience of the first event, we saw it last the season before with Thomas Ronha. You know, he had a fantastic qualifying and then got tangled up in a in a collision with, with Freddie Rasmussen and scored zero points. So if you're going to compare the two and their debut race, you know, it's one new Alfie Butcher because he was able to, to score points uh, on his debut. But I think a really strong performance, great qualifying driver. So hopefully we're going to be seeing a lot of him today. But for him, he needs to just relax a little bit, I think. Not put so much pressure on himself in the race and get those points home. Yeah, and if we talk about also his teammate, I mean, Simon uh, has got Fabrizio Donoso Delgado uh, in his locker too. Someone who has been a veteran of the scene very much so since 2017, where he took Brendan Lee all the way at Yas Marina in what many describe as one of the most groundbreaking final laps as well in F1e, uh, F1 Esports, now known as F1 Sim Racing. But uh, credit to Donoso, still a very valuable servant to Aston Martin. And we'll look to utilize all his experience, not just for himself, but also for the betterment of John Evans, who is the newest recruit to the team. Someone who has uh, only really rubbed in a small number of races over mm -hmm. the course of last season. Seven starts last year. Hasn't yet scored points, but a great chance for the new rookies from last year to get ingrained into the current format. Yeah, I think the big break that we've had between event one and event two is really going to help those who were slightly off the pace. And when I say slightly off the pace, I don't mean like a second off the pace. It's a couple of attempts, maybe a couple of thousands. But because we've had that big break, those who had the advantage were better on the game early on. That's out. That's, that's out the window. Everybody's closed up. They're all going to be so close to each other. And around a circuit like this, it's very fast. I think we're going to be seeing some really, really small gaps all the way down the order from P1 to P20. Yeah, without any shadow of a doubt. I mean, generally, it's mere tenths. In league racing, mm -hmm. we sometimes see mere thousands. So we could yet see some of that, to say the least. I know that some of the drivers were issuing in times that were minuscule in comparison. The gaps thinner than a fly's eyelash, everybody, as now we await the cars to make their way out onto the circuit for finally some life out on the Jetta Corniche, this time with soft tyres. No green lined intermediate tyres this time, but nonetheless, the first to make his way out, well, we've got Philip Prejnader and Ruben Pedrenio, Alpine going out early. Yeah, just a little bit then, I suppose, just to get that, that free air. You don't want to go out when everybody else is out there because if somebody messes up a lap or, or they're potentially even on an outlap, they're going to hold you up and you're going to lose time and it might catch you out. Obviously, you know, you've got to be aware of your mirrors and your engineers and that's the unique thing about um, F1 Sim Racing here is we have the engineers and we have the team managers sat right next to the drivers and they're going to be in their ears giving them information and telling them if a driver is on their way to make sure that they don't hold them up. But here we go, as you can see right now, the Alpine running very slowly, but they're doing exactly what I was saying, holding that brake, holding that throttle, building up tire temperature, and uh, they won't really worry too much about fuel because they'll have enough fuel for their flying lap before heading back into the pits. But this at the moment is all about building up for a lap around Jeddah. Yeah, we've already had somewhat of a silly season as well coming into this second event in F1 uh, Sim Racing. Ruben Pedrenio, of course, a brand new face to the championship and is now making his way around the corner each in the middle sector. Uh, very shortly making his way through and uh, down through towards the hairpin bend as well. Once again, it's already taken one of them. There's two to watch out for. Big overtaking zones here as well, but we'll worry about that when racing action occurs. But there are so many frailties around this track, especially given the fast paced nature of it. Despite there being barriers, step over the white lines, Hayden, you could be in trouble. Yeah, two things to watch out for. Barriers and track limits. Both of them, they're not really going to help you around your flying lap. 
Uh, it's a very tough circuit around Jeddah because the barriers like this corner in particular, just on the inside, and we saw it in real life, Lance Stroll just get it slightly wrong, tap the inside barrier and his race was over. And that can so easily happen to somebody here as well. So you need to make sure you get it spot on, but you don't want to be cautious because if you're cautious, you're losing lap time. And as we've said, four attempts potentially could be what separates first and 20th. So even losing half a second from being slightly cautious into a corner and you could be out in Q1. Yeah, Barry Burrowman, who we're currently seeing on screen too, now hailing at Ferrari, was part of that McLaren lineup last season that would go on to take the team's title, as well as seeing his teammates at the time, Lucas Blakely, go on to win his first championship crown. But incoming now, the outlaps become the fast laps. And it's Barry Burrowman in the prancing horse, the Scuderia Ferrari is about to light up here now around the Saudi Arabian circuit. In the bottom right-hand corner, you can see live pictures of Barry Burrowman as he now makes his way through the first sector, heading through the Salem very shortly. You need to try and keep a pin through this next left and right. A lot of throttle play here, Hayden. You've got to watch your boundaries. Yeah, if you're new to the F1 game, welcome. Everybody's, you know, it's always someone's first time. But just watch that green bar in the center of your screen. That is his throttle application. As, as you can see, he was never fully off it or on the brakes, just feathering it, just getting himself through the corners. And that is, you know, the consistency that we see from these drivers. Through the left, you can also see the ERS bar. Uh, that is the yellow bar, so that's how much deployment. But you're just going to stick it in hot lap in qualifying and fly it all the way to the end. Through the right and then on the left. Run the curb a little bit with your left tire, but don't go too far because it's going to unsettle the car and you can drag you out to the barrier on the right-hand side. Now get as close to the barrier as you wind through this DRS section before the very tricky left-right chicane. Full commitment through here. Tight to the barrier on the left. Take a little bit of curb on the right, but again, don't extend it because it's going to unsettle the car and throw you off into the barrier. Keep it nice and tight all the way through this long curve before getting the car back over to the right-hand side. Look out for the light box on the right. Slam on the brakes. Keep it nice and tight on the apex of the corner. Back on the throttle, and that is a lap here at Jeddah. Yeah, the rapidly faster Rainier now making his way down across the line. Ruben Pedreño setting a 126.271 to kick us off. Barry Burrowman obliterates that by over two tenths of a second. In comes Freddie Rasmussen, the great Dane, now issues his lap to the top with Fabrizio De Noso, marking his return to F1 Esports again with a 26.255. Jed Norgrove, great lap to get things underway. Here comes the two-time champion, the OG champion, Brendan Lee. Yeah, loving the green kick livery that Brendan Lee is donning for this event through the left. So there's been a very strong performance so far from Freddy Rasmussen. He's currently topping the timing sheets with a into the 125s. What well, a lap from him there through the left-hander as uh, Nicholas Longe has pipped Freddy Rasmussen. Now, Brendan Lee through that. Now, this is Thomas Ronhar we're watching. Brendan Lee a little bit further up that, the road. He's going to be gifting DRS and a bit of slipstream to his teammate as they come across the line here, here in Q1. Thomas Ronhar P4, Brendan Lee P6, not quite at the top, and I don't think either driver is going to be comfortable enough to say, Do you know what, I'm done for Q1, I think I'm safe, I'm going to save some tyres for later on. I think those two might just have to go out again. As uh, Here is uh, Jake Benham, has a lap on board at the moment at 26-0, which has put him up there at the moment in P7. Not quite ahead of his teammate, but that's what Mercedes want. They want their two drivers to be very close together to really help them fight in this Constructors Championship. And some sheer tier time evolution, should we say, as we've made our way through the course of the session. If you have a look at the top end, Longay with him going to the top, he's one of the first drivers to break into the 25s, but he's not alone. Challengers champion, Alfie Butcher, mm. second fastest. Wilson Hughes from McLaren, we spoke about what a rough time they had at Bahrain. Great return so far here in Q1. And then you also see Jana Watmir in the top four too, as we now ride on board with Nicholas Longay, someone who I'm sure will be hoping to add yet more accolades to his record. Someone who actually started his career at Red Bull, uh, along with the likes of Freddie Rasmussen, as well as the likes of Yoni Tormler, who historically has driven for the team as well. Another old head, he's driven for Renault. He now drives for the Ferrari outfit. He's also driven for Alfa Romeo. He's had more golf clubs than Tiger Woods, but coming in this one, with the Scuderia Ferrari, an old head, but a reliable one, Hayden. Yeah, I think Nicholas Longay is one of the strongest drivers in the field in terms of raw one lap pace. But over the seasons, and yeah, maybe it's a little bit of inexperience, but I think the consistency has never quite been there for Longay, whether that's a bit of luck or down to driver error. But this is where he's going to now need to iron those out. And, you know, we're allowed to go through that. You don't learn unless you make mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're never going to learn from them. So it's good that he's been making those mistakes over the last few years. And, you know, he had a very strong performance in Bahrain. Now he's top of the timings at the moment here in Q1. It'll be interesting to see how he goes across the rest of the season. Uh, Josh Hido, a strong driver, and even Lucas Blakely, 
our reigning world champion down there in P16, both in a vulnerable position, will definitely have to go again. Yeah, and the fact that they've gone out so late as well just gives them very minimal time in order to correct that. So this remaining lap now, Hayden, is crunch time, essentially. We're going to be arriving into a certainly a situation now where drivers are going to be trying to leave everything out there on the Corniche, and this is certainly Ooh. a circuit you can't take for granted. Alfie Butcher retiring early, a statement of intent by our Challengers champion. He thinks he's safe, and you know, I'm, I was looking at it, and I'm, I'm not too sure, but you know, I don't know what the practice lap times have been, have been showing so far, so maybe he's looking at that and thinking, Do you know what, that's a, t that's a time that some might be on their second lap, but it's not going to be everybody. He might fall down the order to P10, but, you know, it's a lot of confidence there. I'm wondering whether Nicholas Longay would do the same, seeing as uh, they are above Alfie Butcher at the moment. Wilson Hughes also thinks that they're comfortable as well. Two maybe inexperienced drivers, but let's see if they've got the call right. Yeah, Nicholas Longay not taking anything for granted just yet. He's still in the pits, hasn't retired, but hasn't left the box either. Uh, we have got Jed Norgrove now, as we can see on picture, making his way around the circuit. Now most of the grid make their way out on track. Freddie Rasmussen, also one of them, obviously also preempting that even the late 25s aren't enough to get you through to Q2. Needs to try and ensure himself a place in the next session. Obviously, the higher you are, the better it is at uh, this uh, stage of the game. So as you now watch the cars make their way around the hairpin now they're all uh, squabbling for track position so they can enlist their fly well final flying laps and uh, certainly to say the least if you're Barry Burrowman if you're anyone in that bottom five as well or even in that bottom ten the big danger is the elimination zone yeah I said four temps might be the gap that we're looking at and that is what we're seeing right now four temps between Nicholas Longay and Yoni Tomala down in 20th position and all it takes is one correction on your previous lap and you could be up a tenth and where's that going to put you? You know, Yoni Tomler gains a tenth, and he's probably not the best example because he'd only move up to, to P19. But you look at someone like, uh, like Jed Norgrave, he'll gain a tenth, and he'll go up to, to P11, be a little bit more comfortable. So, you know, it's just finding those fine margins in this last lap. Nicholas Longay, again, doesn't think that, uh, that it's worthy to retire, but there's no more time left. Uh, there's one minute left in the session. You need to get out at 2 minutes 30 in order to get a lap in. So Nicholas Longay also believes that he is safe. Uh, frightening as well to see Josh Edo so far down in the bottom five. Has taken two pole positions in his career in F1 sim racing. I heart back to one of his most famous, one of his best, back at Yas Marina at the very end of last season when Blakely would go on to take the title and snatch it from the claws of Freddie Rasmussen. And coming home in third, of course, was our man currently sat in fifth place, Thomas Ronha, to boot too. What a fascinating encounter that was. But Edo bringing his very best. It's not the first time, as I said, he's taken pole. He did it back as well. At Imola, uh, going back the season prior mm -hmm. when he was at McLaren Shadow, uh, unfortunately crashed out as well at Imola in prior seasons. He has got it though, yeah, Hayden, but needs to try and elevate himself out of that bottom five. They've all got it, and that's why they're here. That's why they're here at F1 Sim Racing. So many great talents are on the field, and one of the first drivers who is on a flying lap is Yoni Tomlin. Look at the top right-hand corner of your screens. He is currently up by three tenths of a second, which would put him just off of Nicholas Longay's time. Have Alfie Butcher, Nicholas Longay, and, oh, a little mistake, lost him a little bit of time there, but have they got it wrong? Wilson Hughes as well, because Yoni Tomlin is finding a lot of time as the track rubbers in. He's getting a lot quicker out there, and uh, Yoni, Yoni Tomlin is certainly flying at the moment. Heading down into this winding section, DRS open now, as we're going to be heading into the fast left-right chicane. Two temps up at the moment. He's going to need to find a little bit more to make sure he's definitely comfortable, because if he found those two temps in the first sector, who knows what someone like Lucas Blakely could potentially be finding as well. Keep it nice and tight as they head through in towards the last turn here at Jeddah. Hard on the brakes. Where is Yoni Tormela going to put himself? Currently in the drop zone. He's not safe right now, but can he get himself out of there? Barry Boromund goes top of the timing sheets at the moment. Yoni Tormela crosses the line and it is P13. But I think that could be right on the cusp and he's, I don't think he's going to be safe. That's going to be very tight indeed. In comes Fabrizio Donoso. Delgado! Oh, fastest there for Fabrizio. 25.875. Lucas Blakely, the current champion, in the top 10 with a P9 time. And look at the mere thousands to separate them from the top 
even to the bottom 10. Outrageous! It's Rasmussen now, who goes fast. It's 25-8-3-1. His teammate Josh Edo on the cusp of elimination. In comes the Flying Dutchman, Jarno Otmir, to the top pole position here. Well, not pole position, P1 and Q1. I do apologize. <laughs> Fastest man in the first session. It is Jarno Otmir here at the moment. Thomas Ronhardt, though, Ronhardt, still to cross the line. Yeah, Thomas Ronhardt not done yet. George Morgan getting ahead of himself, getting Worse. very excited, Worse. aren't you? But uh, you know, I'm just as excited as you are. But Thomas oh, Ronhardt invalidated. just backing off at the moment. He, I believe he invalidated. Yes, you can see the red track, uh, but maybe just backing off because he saw that he was safe. Let's save a set of tyres for later on. But interestingly, who's out? Simon Weigang, Ulas is out. Yoni Tormela, Pedredo and Prejneda all out. Sad day for Alpine, both out in Q1. Yeah, of course, in the moment towards the end of that. But yeah, <laughs> incredible. Uh, credit, though, to Mercedes. Fastest and third fastest. Yeah, but oh, it's so close out there, isn't it? Well, so many drivers are going to be fighting for pole position. And I think we're going to have an incredibly exciting qualifying today. There are the standings for us right now. Yep, just uh, currently as we look at our screens, a whole tenth of a second separating Jana Watmir and Freddy Rasmussen. A 25-8-3-1 set by Rasmussen. Uh, that tenth of a second placing him in second for the Great Dane. Jake Benham, really successful session and uh, goes third fastest. Just ahead of Fabrizio Donoso, spring it into life here at this stage uh, at uh, this circuit of well, incredible Jedi Cornish circuit. Uh, Brendan Lee, fifth fastest. We're seeing some of the old faces coming up to the higher echelon, should we say, Hayden? Yeah, just looking further down the field, six tenths separated Presnado. So I don't think it was a, a great last lap there for Presnado. The rest of them were three tenths off. So very, very close in this first Q1 session. We're going to be getting ourselves into Q2 momentarily. But there are our five eliminated drivers. Simon Weigang, unfortunately, the handlebar moustache maybe not working for him. So I <laughs> no. uh, might need to try a, a different type of facial accessory. Uh, Ulas is there. Uh, Sally for him, but they'll be looking at Haas for Alfie Butcher, P10, uh, I believe, or he was up there in that in that last qualifying session, and Yoni Tormela, sadly for him, he was the guy that we first saw flying on that last lap, as uh, it looks for us, Q2 is underway, and uh, we'll be getting into that shortly. We certainly will, uh, Simon Weigang, incidentally, so close, just good to show how minute the gaps truly are, Alpine having a really tough day at the office, losing Ruben Pedrenio and Philip Prejneda in the first session, Yoni Tormela, again, someone who has been here since the dawn of time, in F1 sim racing, uh, now sees himself qualifying just in P18 position and uh, not making it through into Q2. That is going to hurt. Uh, the face looking very focused uh, there on the on the head of Alfie Butcher, just waiting to get back underway. The Q2 session uh, is about to get started. There's his teammate Ulash Zildrim. Our two challenges uh, drivers looking mm -hmm. pretty cool, calm, and collected in the first session. Yeah, looking very calm despite being out in uh, in Q1 there. But you know. Anything can happen, especially around a track like Jeddah, because all it takes is one mistake, and potentially some other drivers can get caught up. Maybe you've gone for an early pit stop, you're away from the rest of the field, something's happened further up, and you can just massively gain. It'll be very interesting to see later with Ty Webb, but that's what they're going to be looking at now for ULAS. They're going to be looking at what they can do for strategy. Maybe take the hards, go really long into the race, jump on the softs later on, and try and cut their way back through the field. It's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. Yeah. Pretty much uh, most of the drivers now out on track and uh, the outlaps well and truly underway. Out there. They know it's qualifying. They are well, it does make <laughs> you wonder a little bit, doesn't it? Don't throw it all out there now, <laughs> chaps. Obviously, we've got to get through Q2, then we've got Q3 afterwards, but uh, nonetheless, fabulous to see some of the old faces as well making their way to the top. Of course, Brendan Lee, uh, we've harked back to his prior results and uh, looking back at Fabrizio Donoso, who has obviously had his fair share of challenges through the course of time in F1 sim racing, but seems revigored, renewed here at Aston Martin. And uh, he's not alone, I'm sure, as we now witness the cars make their way around. There's Brendan Lee, the two-time champion, who now bustles his way out to turn 27. The outlap will become a fast lap. Jake Benham, the first to cross the line, fastly following him. In comes Brendan Lee as they make their way down into turn one. It's weird how close they are. They're all trying to benefit off the slipstream of each other. And did you notice how wide Brendan Lee went to open up that last corner to give you the maximum straight line speed down the fast finish straight? Into the winding sector one, that corner that he just went through there, very tricky on the inside, so easy again, just to fit the inside of the corner and it will throw you out wide. And that one as well, that will drag you out. If you bottom out on that curb, it's like you're skateboarding. You're just gonna be grinding on it, getting a lot of time, and uh, Brennan Lee won't be doing that there as he has invalidated. But I'd imagine a lot of these guys are currently on the set of tires that they set their Q1 lap time. They're not gonna be pushing yet. They're gonna wait for the track to develop later on in 
in the session, get on a brand new set of soft tyres and absolutely go for it. Yeah, made a mistake coming out of turns 9 and 10, just cutting the chicane all together, uh, heading in towards the first of the two hairpins that they have at either side of the track. This is one of the longest circuits on the calendar, not quite as long as Spa, but certainly in terms of the championship that we have in front of us, it definitely exists as one of the longest. It's Thomas Ronha, the uh, current championship leader, if we look back at the points from last time out, and looking to try and stamp his authority on the field. It doesn't matter that you're at the top in Q1. All that matters is getting through to Q2, which is exactly what he's done. Leave everything on the table for Q3, where we have the pole shootout. So now Jake Benham goes to the top with a 126-230, probably likely to see used tyres yep. in the initial stages of Q2 here, Hayden. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's no need to, to waste a set of tyres unless you've got them. But for those drivers who, who are you know at the top end of the field, like. Jano Watmir or, or even Nicholas Longe who saved a set of tyres, Wilson Hughes, Alfie Butcher, they're going to, again, not try to use too many sets of tyres here in this uh, in this Q2 session to give them the maximum amount of tyres and potentially even go for free runs in Q3 to really give them the best shot at pole position. A 26.2, which is four tenths off of the fastest that we saw in uh, Q1. So definitely on old tyres, but you want to get that banker lap in because if something happens to your later lap or, or elsewhere in the field, all it takes is one person to make a mistake, block the whole track, and that ruins everybody else's laps and your banker lap could have been the one that got you into Q3. Especially when they leave it so late uh, at the end of the session where you have to leave everything on the table, everything to chance. Uh, but Mercedes currently representing on their own out on track right now, both drivers enlisting times up at the top, but some drivers find it imperative to have a delta to measure against Hayden. Yeah, I. It, it's one of those things, you, you, when you see your green, you're like, oh my God, I'm up. But then you kind of focus on it maybe a little bit too much that if it drops down, you can it can have a bit of a negative effect on you mentally to be like, okay, now I need to properly send it. But then also, if you lose a lot of time in lap one, you will notice that you'll be in the red, you'll be down maybe a 10th, and therefore you're in that mindset of I've got to try and find time, you're not relaxed, and you end up more likely than not losing even further time across the rest of the lap because you're just chasing it. Yeah, more cars coming out of the pit lane now, including Brendan Lee. And of course, not too concerned yet as to the positioning in the bottom five. Uh, but what I will say is this, is that we are coming in to the final 10 minutes, or sorry, say even the final nine minutes uh, very shortly here in qualifying. They'll only have two laps to effectively usher in, uh, obviously the initial set on those new soft tyres you'd fathom with Benham and Otmir currently sitting up at the top. But the great benefit they have is they can get settled back into the garage, get composed, they can watch the other lap times come in, see where the frailties are, and then head up, head back out on a fresh set of tyres. Yeah, it's very interesting watching this because, I, yeah, I believe you're right, and I think they're just going to go for maybe the ru one run later on at the end of the session now, and both wait till that point. All these guys, they're going to be on a new set of tyres for this run, most likely. Some might not be, trying to see if their banker lap and older set of tyres can get them further up through the field, but but right now, they're going to be on brand new sets of soft tyres, and they're going to try and see if they can do what Nicholas Longay, Alfie Butcher, Wilson Hughes did earlier on, where they can set a lap that's good enough that they're comfortable to retire or just sit in the pit lane and wait for Q3. But it's, it's very risky, but the reward is so great because it gives you that extra set of tyres. And of course, in the modern Formula 1 rules, you do get an extra set of soft tyres as well if you make it into Q3. So it's going to give them a lot of fresh rubber going into the last session in qualifying. Yeah, and Formula 1's all about perfecting the imperfections, isn't it, at the end of the day? It's all about performance, and these drivers know that better than anybody. They would have practised relentlessly back at the factories. Uh, I had a chance, actually, fairly recently to head to Enstone and check out the setup at Alpine. Obviously, unfortunately for them, not making it through to Q2, but it's amazing the equipment they have on offer there to sort of learn and study up on what they have ahead of them for a brand new F1 Esports program, the equipment. Uh, also, at the same time, the training, the fitness levels, very much akin to a real life Formula One driver. Brendan will know that more than anybody. Of course, he was with the Mercedes program only so long ago. And we all saw, given the VTs that we had back in those championships, uh, of what he went through in order to try and improve his performance. And it certainly showed in the 2018 title that he did go on to win. But now making his way back out on track, flying lap now, so key to get this one right. Yeah, I don't think Alpine are going to be inviting you back to Enstone anytime soon. Look at you, you get invited last week and where are they in qualifying? So what have you been doing over there? But Brendan Lee flying through the twisty sector one, avoids the curbs because like I said, they're going to throw you out. But that is a very, very nice through that section of the corners. We have no delta to compare him against his first 
flying lap, so you can't see whether he's up or down compared to his Q1 lap time, but he's going to be back on the throttle again. You don't want to get on too early because it's going to drag you out wide, and then you end up just touching the barrier. You're going to lose time, or you have to back out of the throttle. This is a tough section of corners again. Throw it in too much, take too much speed. You're going to understeer. You're going to invalidate your lap, and it's all over. And of course, Brendan Lee will certainly not be wanting to do that. He's going to try and put it all on this one lap and see what he can do. Yeah, we all saw what uh, Mercedes were capable of in the first session of qualifying. We hark back to Jarno's achievements, very much like Brendan, both two-time champions, but Jarno's recent form has, of course, been stellar where it's come to pre-season or even league racing action. A champion in some places, a race winner in the modern era. Brendan Lee looking to try and crawl his way back to try and go toe-to-toe -to -toe against someone who sat in his seat, a seat that he once sat in back in 2018 and 19. Immediately, Brendan Lee goes to the top. A 125, immediately trumped though by Wilson. Huge, but in comes now Freddie Rasmussen, who immediately takes the top. The Great Dane showing his dominance once again with a 25-6, an illustrious time. But Longe goes into second. Lucas Blakely up into fourth. Still five and 50, still to go here in Q2. Is Ishmael Fassi, the artist around Saudi. He goes second. Wow, what a lap there from Freddy Rasmussen into the point sixes, and even Ishmael Fassi as well. Both of those might be looking at, you know, do you know what, let's, uh, let's just retire from the session now. Let's get straight into Q3. We're both safe. And I think they might just be. Edo across the line. It's not safe for him. P12, he'll definitely have to go again in this qualifying session. Of course, both Mercedes have now been relegated to 13th and 14th, but they were both on new set of tyres, so we have not seen the best out of them yet in this session. Brendan Lee in 11th. Wilson Hughes, he's going to be on the cusp. I thought McLaren were looking good in this session, but both Lucas Blakely and Wilson, it's not quite there for them yet. They're safe if we were to take these results right now, but they're going to get another run later. Yeah, obviously we just saw how much of a difference it does make with the time and track evolution as well as actual tyre time evolution as well as more and more cars cross the line. Unfortunately for Brendan Lee, one sitting closer to the top, now sees himself in the elimination zone, needs to try and build that back. There's Freddie Rasmussen, just looks unperturbed, ruthless is what I would describe. Ruthless Rasmussen here once again at Saudi, here at Jeddah to become a champion for the first time this season. I'm sure the wounds are still burning raw <laughs> here in F1 Sim Racing. Yeah, Freddie Rasmussen, always one of the most consistent drivers we have in F1 Sim Racing. But here we go. We are building up now for the last laps. Mercedes out of the cycle and looking at all the cars out on track, they're going to be out of the way. They're going to file into the pit lane and hopefully there for Jana Watmir. He's going to have no traffic whatsoever on his fast lap. And you can just watch the throttle application, watch the brake. It's going to be building up as uh, he's using battery at the moment. So um, not really rebuilding it up at the moment. So I'm not sure what's going on. It's definitely not a fast lap. He's eight temps down on this one. He's going to want to maybe build that back up to give himself a full battery again. Yeah, coming into the pits now to get prepped for their uh, final runs. Jarno uh, now out on track, looking to try and bid at least one final lap, bring it to the table, I'm sure. Uh, but um, obviously the laps that he and Jake set very early on, not necessarily relevant now. He set them on used tyres, no doubt. We believe that anyway, based on the times that we saw. No, my bad, I've got it wrong. He has set a flying lap. If you look at the top left, it's a bit small on Jarno's screen. He wants a small indicator, but he is first. He did actually go out on a new set of soft he tires. So he's so done a lap. Fast. He's up there. He was out of the cycle. Wasn't quite in the slipstream of all the other teams, but it's set a lap time, and he's up there. But I think, I don't know if he's going to be able to get back in the pits, but he could just be on the cusp. If he's feeling, you know, a little bit fruity, he might just want to retire from this and, and see if he can get into, into Q3, but it's oh, it's so close, isn't it? We'll wait for the end of Q2 to see how fruity he is feeling, <laughs> indeed. Lucas Blakely heading back out onto the track, the current F1 Sim Racing Champion. Did it in great style. We all saw the raw emotion from him, and he's done some great things ever since that championship too, beating the likes of Valtteri Bottas and Sebastian Vettel at Race of Champions. And not only that, has since taken to the GB4 circuit as well, taking a P3 podium in what he described as one of his greatest achievements as well, alongside his F1 sim racing title from last season. Has done so much, of course, a former Carter that became a sim racer. As we all know, budget's a fraught issue in the world of motorsport. Blakely could no longer continue in the real world, but in the sim racing world, he's one of the best. Yeah, and we've seen that so many times throughout the years with F1 Sim Racing. Of course, Jarno Watmir has a real-life experience as well. Jem Bullock Bassi went over to uh, Super Formula recently as well. We've even got Marcel Kiefer, who's going to be dabbling into that in the future, a former F1 Sim Racing driver. But uh, it, it's so great to see that 
you know, you have that parachute for drivers who maybe don't find their way in karting, but they can fall back on sim racing, and the skills are transferable. It's not like another game where you can go and, and take that and, and then you're, you're the greatest footballer out on the planet, but here you can, you know, you can jump in a sim, get up to speed, get comfortable, get as fast as these guys, and, you know, they could comfortably be put in a car and, as you say, beat Valtteri Bottas and Sebastian Vettel. Yeah, fighting for track position at the moment, though, as they make their way. Ironically, I mean, that was a stellar result for Blakely, beating Bottas and Vettel, and he did it here at Sweden as well, so... Maybe there's something in the air here at Sweden. Maybe, maybe although event one didn't really go to plan for him. No, the front wing, And it is on zero points at the moment. But we have a long event. Six races across this first one. We've got so many more to come. And to come, we have Lucas Blakely, who's about to start his lap here at Cheddar. Yeah, for the first time, we'll now make our way around for the final showings here in Q2. And... Uh, to what Saudi has really delivered over the years, certainly in real life F1, we've seen drama aplenty. I'm sure we'll see plenty here at Saudi Arabia. Through the first sector, as I said, three DRS detection zones for the drivers to manage. Blakely's now going to make his way through this first sector now, out of turns one and turns two. That becomes three, four, and eventually five as he heads through the slalom, through turn six and seven as well, lighting things up, taking the curves, full aggression here. He spoke to me about his setup as well, as how unhinged it truly is. You really need to be an experienced performer to be able to handle a car like that as he makes his way through the first of two hairpin bends now and he'll be heading now he's purple like I say in the first sector as well so this is a great showing here from Blakely so far the champion looking to become champion renewed here at this point obviously still a long way to go but if you can strike your moniker early here in event two it can make all the difference in the world certainly he's going to be wanting to research back up the up the standing orders after the disappointment of Bahrain, throwing it through the left and the right, We're using a little bit of curve, he's up one uh, point one at second, one tenth, nearly two tenths now, purple in sector two as well. Qual qualifying is complete, that is the last of our laps here in Q2. Lucas Blakely rounds the final corner, gets it close to the barrier, don't get too early on the power, perfect. Back on, down the foot start, finish straight, DRS open, across the line, is it gonna be free, purple sectors? No, it's not, but it is, at the moment, P1. The All-Star Jay Benham goes second fastest, just behind Blakely, two Bs in the surname, enlisting up at the top two, across the line, Freddie Rasmussen stays third as Wilson Hughes goes fourth. Here comes Barry Burman, the rapidly fast Iranian, donning the Scuderia Ferrari. He has done stellar in the past, is looking now to pursue even greater plaudits than that of a team's champion last season. Yellow flags in the final sector as we await more cars to dodge traffic further back. Barry goes fourth ahead of Rasmussen. Here comes the artist, Ishmael Fassi, into the pits. Could it be all over for Fassi? It could be. He's on the cusp. He's in P7 at the moment. That is risky. We've got great drivers further down the field. Jed Northgrove also bailing out of it. He is in P15. Nicholas Ongay only moves up to P8. Fassi is still safe for now. We ride on board with Freddy Rasmussen. He looks safe at the moment. He's P7 in the standing. Shotito joins him in eighth. Where will Freddy Rasmussen be here? He's down his lap time, so he will not improve. It's a 25.8. And uh, thankfully, he's looked to the race director for us to tell us where everybody is. But there we go. Freddy Rasmussen safe. And we'll have to wait the results as uh, right. Jarno Otmir. And he's not the only one. 12th position out in Q2. Two two-time world champions out in Q2. Both Jarno Otmir and Brendan Lee. But it's Blakely who goes fastest. 42,000 quicker than Alfie Butcher with Jake Benham. Now representing the Sol Mercedes in Q3. 83,000. A whole tenth within are the top three. It's truly stellar. Thomas Ronha fifth. Fabrizio Donoso in sixth. Frederick, Frederick Rasmussen then further down in seventh. Josh Edo, Red Bull looking so strong heading into the shootout now very shortly. Wilson Hughes and Ishmael Fassi just barely getting through after coming into the pit lane so late on. But we lose Longe, Otmir, Caraton, Norgrove. I think the biggest shock, two two-time champions out in Q2. Yeah, and the gaps are incredible. For Nicholas Longe to make it into Q3, the gap is, you know, 13 thousandths of a second. That is, you know, smaller than a fly's eyelid, as you love to Gaps say. Gaps thinner than a fly's eyelid. Sorry, I think sorry, you know, I'm Hayden ruining your was... phrase. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> but yeah, to see, you know, Jarno Otmir out by, again, such a small margin, just goes to show the caliber and also how much all the drivers have caught up over this break that we've had between event uh, one and event two. Yeah, well, I, as I understand it, we do have an interview standing by. Claire Cossing is with Jarno Otmir. Oh, Jarno, I'm so sorry about that. Because see the disappointment in your face. Just talk us through what happened out there. 
Um, yeah, first Q1 lap was really good already. We would have been enough to get into uh, Q2 anyway. Um, and then the last lap in Q1 I, I nailed. So it was frustrating that I went out in Q2. Um, first Q2 lap was really good as well, but the last one just was a little bit too careful. Um, didn't think I had to improve that much. So uh, left some margin out there just to uh, make sure I wasn't tapping any walls because you will get a uh, lap time invalidation if you do. So I had to make sure to stay clean of that. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, we just missed out by like, I think 200s or something. So yeah, um, luckily it's, uh, it's a good race for, for overtaking. So uh, we'll see how it goes in the race. I was going to say, how do you think the race is going to go? Jed is such a, a track that really doesn't allow any errors. Yeah, exactly. Um, and not to mention the 3D rest zones. Um, and in those 3D rest zones, you of course gain massively. So I reckon even if the leader does get away from the rest of the pack, they will catch back up quite easily. So the, um, the group stays quite close together. Um, and I reckon we will see lots of different strategies. So. Was the track a little bit different from what you expected in a competitive sort of way? Because I know you've raced in this in various other leagues, but obviously in F1 sim racing, you haven't raced it yet. Um, no, it, it is a little bit different, of course, uh, doing it in the LAN environment because you've got no practice on Jeddah beforehand. And yeah, I need to jump into it. Can't make any errors, can't hit any walls. Uh, quite an easy track to invalidate your lap time as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's of course a bit different, but um, yeah, I just kind of uh, miscalculated the Q2 cutoff time a little bit. So. Well, hard luck, but good luck for the race. Uh, well, as you hear there, Jana Omir, obviously out ahead of the pole position fight. Pit lane reporter CC getting all the scoops there from Jana Watmir. Not necessarily positive ones on his part, but confirming what we were discussing, Hayden, I think, about the characteristics of this track at Jeddah. Close walls, white lines. You could be the best driver in the world. It can claim you. Yeah, you can still get it wrong. But I, I would say for Jana Watmir, his qualifying has been very on and off. Sometimes he's incredible. Sometimes he's up the front. Sometimes he's a little bit further down, out in Q2, out in Q1. But I say one driver who you can always back on trying to get back through the field, it is Jano Watmir. He'll pull off some sort of strategy out the bag. We've seen some great overtakes from him in recent history, and I'm sure he's going to find his way somehow up at the front of the field. Yeah, and if we consider the racing as well, I mean, Q2 isn't out of the question. I mean, Jano is one of the, the speed demons, one of also the great strategists. Mm -hmm. We look back at Kota last season, one of his yeah. most impressive performances, I would say, one of the greatest performances in, in all time of F1 esports, and I'm sure he'll be looking to do that again. Kota is actually on the calendar this season too. But uh, as we're now watching the cars make their way out for Q3, the pole shoots out now, Hayden. Different complexion here around the Jeddah Corniche. It's now all about enlisting your fastest time now it's all about pole position yeah i'm really interested to see who has new tires to their name and how many they have obviously they all have one set guarantee because you get gifted that if you make it into q3 but who's been holding on to them freddie rasman we saw him not improve at the end of q2 was that a mistake or did he just go out on a used set of tires to save a brand new set for q3 we'll have to watch out for Rasmussen's time. Wilson Hughes obviously had a great Q1, could retire out of that one, but he did have to go again in Q2. So it'll be interesting again to see if he's got maybe something up his sleeve as well. Alfie Butcher, just quietly been there. You know, he's, he's, he's not been setting the fastest times in the session, but he's certainly been up at the top. He could yet bring the carving knife down upon the Jeddah Corny circuit. Never right off Alfie Butcher. Uh, Barry Burrowman there in the bottom right-hand corner, someone who is also very imposing, actually began his career at Mercedes uh, all the way back then. Obviously, obviously, that was prior to McLaren, and uh, has also put down some stellar performances, also familiar with pole position as well. We are going to Spa tomorrow. That was where Barry took his first pole and his only pole to yeah. date here in F1, in F1 Sim Racing. Yeah, an incredible drive, and obviously what a lineup we had last season with uh with uh, Lucas Bakley and Barry Borman. Now we've got that with Nicholas Longay and Barry Borman. But let's take on board in one of my favorite sections here in Jeddah because you've just got to be so on it. Close the barrier on the left. Don't get sucked out on the right, but keep it nice and tight. Set up the left. It's a double left-hand corner. Again, through the right, there's a curb on the outside. Don't bottom out on that one because your lap's going to be completely over. And that was perfect through that sector there for Barry Borman. Look at the concentration on his face. A little smirk there at the camera. He's purple at the moment, but he's one of the first drivers out on track here in Q3. Again, it'll be interesting to see whether this is an old or a new set of soft tires, as he can take a little bit of a rest before getting back on the brakes, throw it through the right and the left. Another chicane here at Jeddah. Set yourself up again, winding through this section. You want to keep it close to the barriers. Use that little bit of off-track just to gain you those extra valuable tenths of a second. 
we now switch over to riding on board with Wilson Hughes, who's one of the first drivers who's going to be setting a lap time here in Q3. Yeah, and a better response. We've alluded to the better response from McLaren. The team in Papaya looking to try and bring it all back. This time, Ajeda, first laps now coming in here in Q3. Hughes is going to be the first to show what his hand truly is. And a 25-7, that's not a bad way to start, Wilson Hughes. Barry Burrowman now also making his way up towards the line too. He's going to be listing his first time of the session. He can't yet beat the driver that has replaced him effectively in his seat from last season. Barry now in second place. Lucas Blakely, third place. So Barry splitting the two McLarens right now, but more cars still yet to cross the line. In comes F1 Esports Challengers champion Alfie Butcher dominated that season. He's showing his true abilities again here. Goes fastest with a blistering 125.4. That's stellar. Fast he goes fifth. He's been holding that set of tires up his sleeve into the point fours. Hello, but there he is. Freddy Rasmussen into the fours as well. Nearly snuck into the point threes and he definitely had spare tires set for this qualifying session. Uh, so the other guy's going to have to beat it in the second lap, but uh, look at the times there from those guys. Thomas Ronhard really strong as well, but you've got to assume from further down, Wilson Hughes uh, down to Jake Benham, they're all on an used set of soft tyres, and we're going to really see the best out of them in the latter stages of this session. Could it be Freddie's year? That's the big question. Jake Benham, who uh, must be said, not having the best of times right now, but will set a lap nonetheless to see where he sits himself, goes P8. Uh, obviously might have fancied himself further up, but in this initial stage, it's about getting that first lap under your belt here, Hayden. Obviously, we know how vicious this track truly is. Jano, Jano just spoke about it in interview. Obviously, a tough lap for him in those final stages. Very rarely do we see him outside of the top 10, but he's a master at getting back in. Then again, Mercedes have the opportunity to maybe split the strats because they've got Benham in the top 10. Jano, who's going to be, should we say, in the top half of the bottom 10. Yeah, it's going to be a simpler strategy here at, uh, at Jetta later on for the race. You're either looking at maybe a medium hard or a hard medium, just a one stopper. But if you really want to try and switch things up, go for something different, you could potentially go soft, but it's going to, you'll get that advantage at the, at the start of the race, but you really need to get yourself through the field and then also break away because you're going to be a bit of a sitting duck on the hards. The better sort of alternate strategy would to be going hard go really long, try and stay with the pack as much as you can, and then when you've got those soft tyres on, blitz it back through the field and try and get as many overtakes as possible. Could be potentially something we see from Jarno Opnir. We'll just have to wait and see when we get to it later. But uh, yeah, some really imp impressive performances. Again, Alfie Butcher, not at the top, not P1, but right up there at the front, on the front row once again. But this time it's going to be important for him to make sure he gets the race right. Yeah, I mean, he's performing valiantly for a rookie uh, at this point. So keep your eyes peeled for Alfie Butcher, folks. Jake Benham, uh, as we said before, currently sat in eighth fast. This is Shmel Fassi, also another debutant this season uh, in the top 10. So it's been a good year for some of the new drivers. Of course, Fassi uh, has been fighting nip and tuck and uh, is now joined by another fellow rookie, Will Lewis, who is now part of the Williams fold, not competing in this particular race but uh, I'm sure we'll see him uh, later in the season. But Fassi, currently ninth. Don't know, so the only driver not set a time, so that's going to place huge pressure on the Aston Martin driver. Yeah, but again, another driver who's quietly kind of snuck himself in there. We've not really mentioned too much about either Aston Martin driver, apart from you know, Simon Weigang was out in Q1, but for Donoso, he's just kind of gone under the radar. He snuck himself into, into P10. So let's see what he can do. He hasn't set a lap yet, so he's not really going to bother about setting that banker time on that used set of tyres. He's going to wait. He's going to use that fresh set of softs, go at the end of the session. We're looking about two minutes 30, it's kind of like the, the around the latest you want to get out there. So for uh, Jake Benham, he's going to be wanting to get a move on to get himself out of the pits, and we can see it now. We've got Wilson Hughes, we've got the Ferrari there of Barry Burman, and I think I saw another McLaren of Lucas Blakely, yes it is, who is currently leading this pack. But they're all going to get slipstream off him, so it'll be interesting to see what sort of gaps they give each other in this last few minutes of qualifying. Yeah, on one uh, side of the side of the sword you could say he has got clean air but mm. obviously the other issue is then away then again he does give away a little yep. bit of slipstream so this is the battle you've one, got sector one is going to be a bit tricky a bit dicey. If, you're, if you're behind someone you're going to be getting that dirty air losing Absolutely. the car slightly so you kind of want to pick up that slipstream towards the end of the lap yeah it's vital down the long straight if anything coming out of turn 27 in towards turn one but uh, naturally uh, that's a very fine margin when you consider everything else you've got to encounter around the track. There's still another 26 corners that they've got to take. But uh, still, to say the least, it's all down to Blakely. He's going to take them through on this outlap. And uh, this would be the perfect recovery if they could enlist a really stellar time here at this point, Hayden. 
Wilson Hughes has just overtaken Barry Borman to get himself behind Lucas Blakely. Now, I'm interested to know whether they've switched the two drivers to try and give one of the other ones slipstream. Who are they benefiting? Or has Wilson Hughes, maybe when they've been back at the factory, the time trial times, the practice qualifying, has Wilson been showing the better pace here at Jeddah? So he's the one that they're going to be wanting to put it all onto to try and get themselves out the front. And is Lucas Blakely really just going to be there to punch a hole for his teammate? We do have to wonder, as now Blakely sets sail through the next chicane. This is a very much, well, very much a blind chicane. You don't know what's coming around the other side, uh, but obviously in qualifying, you shouldn't see another car there. Though uh, in race trim, you could see something very different uh, when we make our way around the track later on this evening. But uh, Blakely now coming through towards the final corner, turn 27, as he now makes his way around. Very key to take this as wide as possible so you can get as much long straight time as possible, as much momentum as you can before you tackle turn one. Lucas Blakely, I'm gonna call him the Flying Scotsman, heading down towards turn one, Hayden, take us away. Here we go, into the first corner, ride the orange kerb on the inside and keep it nice and tight through turn two. Then get it out to the left, use all of the runoff area on the left-hand side, get it as close to the barrier as you dare. Hard on the brakes, in between the 50 and the 100 meter board, throw it through the left, then the right. Keep the car to the right as close as you possibly can and just get close to the barriers. That's all you can really hope for. Fly through this section and you have to be absolutely spot on. One temp, two temps up is Lucas Blakely at the moment here at Jeddah. Take a moment to breathe after that tough sector one before back on the brakes and throwing into this on camber corner. You can get on the accelerator a little bit early as the camber's gonna help you through there, but too early and you get dragged out to the outside barrier. Again, use the off track to kind of save you those valuable thousandths of a second through the right, then the left, then back on the throttle once again. A little twitch there on the exit, but he corrected it well, didn't look like he tapped the barrier. Two and a half tenths up there for Lucas Blakely. DRS now open as he heads into the final tricky chicane cor corner. Qualifying is over through the left, no touching of the inside wall, but he probably could have got a little bit closer to gain a few thousands through there. Now nice and tight through what is kind of like the spoonish kind of corner of this circuit into the last turn. Lucas Blakely, he's purple in sector one. He's purple in sector two. Can he go purple in sector three? That's the big question. Purple in the first two sectors. Can he make it a perfect trio? Lucas Blakely, the current reigning F1 Sim Racing champion, comes up towards the line. Goes immediately, though. Third fastest. That final sector was key. Wilson Hughes comes across the line. Does not improve from fifth fastest. Here comes Barry Burman, the rapidly faster radiant. He goes to the top. Immediately trumps a 125-373 to the field. In comes the Challengers champion, Alfie Butcher, bringing down the carving knife of Pum, Freddy Rasmussen as he goes second. Here comes now from Prinzio Donoso. He goes six fast. It's a great day at the office for Aston Martin. As far as he's concerned, the Chilean in sixth place, Freddy Rasmussen back again to the front, retaliates in perfect style as Fassi goes fourth fastest. We haven't seen Josh Ido across the line yet. And where is that going to put him? Freddy Rasmussen, though, very, very strong qualifying. Jake Benham sadly down in 10th there in Q3. But what a lap there from Freddie, but also what a lap from our newbies. Ismail Fassi and Alfie Butcher up there in the top four. And in the end, Josh Edo set his lap for P7. Six temps separating the top 10. Jake Benham didn't get a great lap in the end, but two temps separating our top 10. 25 thousandths of a second separating Freddie Rasmussen, Barry Burman, Alfie Butcher up there as well. 27 thousandths, the top three separating by three hundredths. Insane. Freddie F1 Ra Sim Racing, welcome. Incredible, Hayden. Freddie Rasmussen, a great day. 25 thousandths faster than Barry Burman. The top three all within 27 thousandths. Alfie Butcher's on the pace. Do never, don't ever count him out. Ishmael Fassi, the artist, fourth face. Saudi Arabia is his canvas, but Freddie coming back to the top once again. Yeah, like I said, this might be where he kind of like shows the best of himself. We're in a LAN event. There's a very hectic schedule. Consistency is going to be key. And he is one of the most consistent drivers that we have in the field as Claire Cottingham is going to be grabbing him for an interview. And we'll throw over to them once she's, uh, he's got out of his rig. Obviously, these, these rigs are the same for everyone, but they're a little bit difficult to get out of because you know, they're, they're kind of welded to the driver to be as comfortable as possible to make sure that they are ready for the racing. Yeah, it certainly are, but uh, nonetheless, it's truly proven to be a stellar, stellar performance from Freddie Rasmussen, and we can hear from him now. He's standing by with CC. Well, Freddie, congratulations. I mean, at the top, I mean, it was close between you and the Ferrari. How did you manage just to pull it out the end there? Uh, I guess I got lucky with the walls. <laughs> I don't think you got lucky. I think there was a bit of skill in there, surely. Yeah, I mean, Jeddah is a really hard track to nail. Um, 
everyone was quite far off in quali, um, but I guess I was the closest to our personal best. Talk me through how much preparation you did ahead of this qualifying session. As we were speaking to Jano earlier, it's not a track that you have done in F1 sim racing. Yeah, we've been preparing a lot the past couple of months. At first, I really struggled with this track, but then it slowly came to me and I started to get faster at it. Talk to me about the hard parts of it. Obviously, sector one's quite tricky. Is that where you were losing time, gaining time? Yeah, it's all about sector one. And then there's two more really hard corners where you have to send it and hope you get lucky with the walls. Did you think you were going to be this lucky to be on pole position ahead of Jeddah? Um, I was hoping. <laughs> okay, well, we've also got another qualifying session coming up very shortly in Austria. Is that a track you know a bit more and you're happier about? Yeah, I'm very familiar with Red Bull Ring, so should be a good one. Okay, so what happens now? You're just going to go chill out? You're going to get some food? You're going to relax? Just relax, yeah. Not a lot of time, is there? Well, there you go. There's your pole sitter for Jeddah. Well, there we have it. Guys, what did you make of that? It's a great qualifying session. Really, really close between the top three. And as you can see, all the drivers kind of mingling behind themselves, discussing that qualifying amongst themselves and sort of seeing how did you manage to get that lap time or yeah. I was a little bit slower here. How did you manage to get that close to the barrier? But uh, yeah, what a lap there from Freddie Rasmussen. Pretty impressive. You look like you need to take a breather there. Have a little <laughs> cool down, George. It's, pad it's paddock esque here. Well done. Like well done, Williams. Ismail Fassi, brand, obviously brand new to the series. Williams have got a lot of stock in this young man. I tell you what, he's so, so good. I, I'm a, we, we've got to give plaudits to Freddie Rasmussen here. Uh, I mean, that is 16 career pole positions in F1 sim racing. Uh, I mean, what a record. That was something quite special, I have to say. Very special indeed. Close and mm -hmm. action to the last minute. Let's talk about Alfie Butcher a little bit as well, putting yeah. it up there. Yeah, stunning performance once again from him. He kind of, you know, reassured us that it wasn't just a flash in the pan in Bahrain. It wasn't yeah. just a one-off being up there in qualifying. He's back there again. And, but I just want to keep on pushing this, that he needs to make sure that he sorts out his races, needs to get mm -hmm. that experience, just be a little bit more comfortable, just not put so much pressure on himself. And just take it easy, get the points home and build upon it. And that's what Thomas Ronhard did last season and was right there fighting for the championship. And I think he can definitely do that because the pace is there. George, coming to you, what were the other standout points for you during that qualifying? Well, I, I definitely think Alfie Butcher was a huge talking point. I think coming in so early on in his yeah. career, I mean, I mean, round one was impressive enough, but to take on the very best, they were all within three thousandths of a second in the top three. That is just sensational. We heard the gaps were going to be minute this week, uh, but that is different level. Uh, I mean, we haven't even seen that in league racing. I mean, th this is just something else. So uh, I think there's going to be some aggrievement on Mercedes side. There's going to be a lot of what ifs there, I think, from what we saw in Q2. But as far as Red Bull are concerned, they're perfectly placed for this race. You mentioned Mercedes. They're another team that will be uh Feeling a bit disappointed there is the Alpine, mm -hmm. not Oosh. what they would have wanted either. Yeah, kind of reflecting real life at the moment down at yeah. the bottom of the field. But we've got another qualifying session to go later on. They need to kind of put that to the back of their minds. They can focus on the strategy and how they're going to perform later on in the race in Jeddah. But for now, let's get ourselves built up for Austria. Maybe Jeddah wasn't a strong track for them, but maybe Austria is one where they put a lot of effort into the team and they're going to bounce back. Well, we will see. But for now, Claire has been out and about and she has managed to find someone else to chat to. Claire, where are you and what can you tell us? Come down to Ferrari, of course, Ariana. And alongside me is Jonah Martins, a race engineer here at Ferrari. <gasps> it was so close, yeah. so close. I'm yeah. so sorry. You must be pleased, though. Yeah, I'm very happy um, with Barry, of course, in P2. It's very close to Freddy. He did uh, an exceptional lap, but uh, yeah, it was very close, super tight. In the end, happy to be P2 because in Jeddah, the race is all to play for. So it's kind of P2 and P2, P2, P2 and P1 is a bit the same. So um, yeah, I'm happy, uh, happy we're starting P2 with one of the cars at least. And I saw Barry's reaction when Freddy set the fastest lap and he was still cheering. He was absolutely punching the air. What does it mean to him to get second place in Jeddah? Um, yeah, I think he's very happy to qualify at the top again towards the front because Jeddah, the race, uh, is very, very all to play for. So P2 is a very good place to start. Um, yeah, for Barry, it means a lot. A lot of hard work has gone into the, into the season back to, and behind the scenes. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy for Barry to start P2 here. I like it, though, because you guys have kind of been like the quiet assassins over here. You sort of get yourself together. Freddie Rasmussen was 
on a, in a league of his own just at the end. What can we do then coming to, to Jeddah? A lot of the drivers are saying the wall is the issue here. You know, any mistake that you can make is a, is a real issue. But starting second on the grid for Barry is going to be a real advantage going into turn one. Yeah, I think it's uh, in turn one, there's a lot to fight for. Um, Freddy has a lot of racing experience, so I'm sure it will be a good fight towards the front. But as I said, in, in the race, it's all to play for. Um, you can win from last on the grid even here, so we need to, we need to nail the strategy as well tonight. So uh, a question that knows that any race engineer doesn't like to ever be asked, but I'm going to ask anyway. You going to tell me the strategy? Can we hear about it? Um, no, unfortunately not. Unbelievable. I don't, I, don't think we, I don't think we know even yet. We have a lot of time to think about it. So, uh, And we have two cars, one a bit more down, so uh, we can see what we can do. Now the qualifying session coming up. Austria, a track that suits your drivers? Um, yeah, I think we have good pace there. I think we um, are quite fast, quite very consistent, which is good. So I hope we can qualify towards the front there as well. It is fighting talk from Ferrari, Ariana. It is fighting talk indeed, and rightly so, I think, rightly so. I have to say the atmosphere in here is amazing, isn't it, guys? Having everyone just milling around, having a little chat, so I can see people getting their content done as well. It's <laughs> nice, isn't it? There's lots, lots of high-fiving going Yeah. <laughs> I, I love this, and that's why I love that we are back finally in a LAN event, because unlike maybe the real-life Formula 1 paddock you've got, <laughs> apart from having a part with George Morgan, <laughs> but <laughs> unlike being in a real-life Formula 1 paddock, the teams don't necessarily mix as much as we see here, whereas all these drivers, they speak all at home. Yeah. They're all good friends. You go off in their little friendship groups, and it's not just teams. It's not just McLaren here and Ferrari here. You've got a lot of teams mixing. We were out for dinner last night, and we saw that, you know, we had Mercedes, Aston, Ferrari all having dinner together. And it's just lovely to see all these guys just great friends. It is such a lovely atmosphere. And, of course, they're all sort of calming down mm -hmm. before they go again. But before we move our attention to what is to come, let's have a little look, shall we, at our provisional starting grid. Guys, talk us through it, George. Well, here is the grid. Alpine, tough day at the office. Philip Prejnader at the back with Ruben Pedreño alongside him in 19th place. A lot of work to do. Yoni Tormela in 18th. You last for children. We're looking to fight through the field from P17 on the grid too. Looking ahead. To P16 as well, we've got Simon Weigang and Aston Martin looking to fight through too with Jed Norgrove back again, this time P15. Further up, Brendan Lee, two-time champion, had a tough time uh, stepping into Q2. Alvaro Caraton, another veteran, uh, this time from Williams Esports alongside him. Jana Watmir, major shocks in P12 with Nicholas Longay, uh, fellow veteran too, in 11th place. We move into the top 10, Jake Benham, the all-star, back again alongside Friend, but not necessarily all friends here in the paddock, given the fact Wilson Hughes is alongside him in ninth place. In eighth place, Fabrizio Donoso, welcome back, Fabrizio, runner-up in 2017. Josh Edo lines up alongside him in seventh. Further up in sixth, the last time-out race winner, Thomas Ronha, the Dutchman, alongside reigning champion, Lucas Blakely, who starts fifth. In P4, Ishmael Fassi, the artist, debut season, not a bad performance in Saudi Arabia. Alfie Butcher, the challenges champion, second row of the grid and was only 27 thousandths off the top. Barry Burraman in second, got very close, but the great Dane was the one who took all the plaudits, all the spoils. He's on pole for the 16th time in his career. 16th time, wow, that is impressive. As we said, that is one of the qualifying sessions done and dusted. I want to bring it back to Mr. Mm -hmm. Alfie Butcher, though. I think we need another word on him. And actually, we've got a little, uh, little something up our sleeve. Let's take a little look. Hello, my name is Alfie Butcher, F1 Esports driver for MoneyGram Haas F1 team. Uh, it's really good to be back. Um, it's been quite tough preparation, very hectic, but very much looking forward to racing again uh, in a LAN environment and uh, yeah, hoping for a good event. F1 Esports Challenges was a very good step up for me. It was a great stepping stone to get into the Pro Series and uh, yeah, it's really helped my confidence going into the series and uh, hopefully we'll see that on track. Precision, uh, putting a lap together when it's when it's needed and qualifying is very key for uh, for a pro series like this. Uh, it's very important to qualify well as that will give you the best chance to do well in the race. So riding on board with oh. Alfie Butcher, he's just putting in lap after lap. I'm hoping to uh, be able to put the lap under pressure together when it's needed to translate into a good race. I don't have too many expectations, I just want to do the best possible. Being the youngest driver in the series is definitely an achievement in itself, so I'm hoping to get my best shot and uh, let's see what we can do. So young, 
So <laughs> much talent and so much potential. Just look at those stats, guys. It's pretty special, isn't it? Yeah, great driver, but also a really, really lovely guy. We've had the pleasure to meet him uh, whilst we've been here in Sweden. His dad's here as well. He's a great guy as well. It's good to have the family about <laughs> as well. But, you know, look at those. Look at those stats from the challenges. Four wins, five podiums. One pole position, though, which is a little bit more surprising to me because his pace in qualifying has been his strongest suit so far in this event. Yeah, it just goes to show how dexterity, uh, dexterous he is as well. I mean, moving across from challenges, but also having the ability, you know, to go from online into the, uh, the land sense, which are two very different things. But it just goes to show how versatile young Alfie Butcher really, really is. Indeed. And we're just getting some replays there. Now, guys, talk, talk us through what we're seeing here. This is the final lap here uh, in qualifying as he's just coming across the line. You can just see he's only up by, you know, 6, 60 thousandths of a second, six hundredths of a second. But it puts him up into P2 behind Barry Borman there. And uh, as you can see, you know, there's going to be that relief to be mm -hmm. up at the top. But for him, he's also going to want pole because there is an extra point for pole position. So exactly. it's a point lost out. So whilst he'll be very happy to be starting the race from the front, he knows it was only a mere three hundredths of a second away from an extra point. So close. And as we said at the top of the show, every point counts here. And that extra point for pole position could really make a big difference when it comes down to it. But thankfully for all of these drivers, we're only on the second race mm -hmm. and they have plenty more to come. And that's got to be a bit reassuring, right, George? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're only at the early stages of event two. There's a long uh, plethora of races that they have got to encounter. Uh, we've still got Austria to come later on with qualifying. Uh, so yeah, it's still early stages, but it's important to really get yourself kicked off at the right, in the right manner. Uh, with the right head. Uh, Freddie clearly looks ingrained into what he's doing. And, uh, you know, but Alfie Butcher's been so impressive uh, in what he's brought to the table. Also really impressed with Ishmael Fassi, by the mm -hmm. way, another young debutant uh, who has really risen to the occasion. I know that Williams hold a lot of stock in this young man. He was brilliant in league racing, has adapted to the LAN environment very well. Yeah, and, and Donoso, a veteran coming back as well. Someone who took Brendan Lee all the way in 2017. Uh, but then again, take stock of what you've achieved. Now it's time to think forward. Let's look at Austria. <laughs> it is time to look forward. Two very different circuits. Jeddah is done and dusted. Based on what you've just mm -hmm. seen, guys, of course, we're going to unpack everything when we get into Austria. But who are you concerned for looking ahead? Concerned for, again, the Alpine. Yeah. Things haven't looked good for them. And yes, I said that hopefully maybe they put more effort into, uh, into Austria and they'll be stronger. But maybe this is just their ultimate pace, or maybe, you know, being in the LAN environment, you have got distractions. Whilst it's not as much as event one, we haven't got a live yeah. audience who are going to be walking about, but we still have cameras dotting about and lights that are changing. So those tiny little distractions could be what's potentially putting them down the order. And what about you, George? That's who we might be concerned about, but who do you think could be strong there? Are we going to see Freddie again? Well, with it being such a short track, we've gone from one of the longest yeah. circuits to one of the shortest now. So it's a lottery now, in a sense. Mm. And, and you've got so many treacherous bends as well. For only 10 corners around a track, uh, Remus, very easy to oversteer at turn three. Head down to Slosh Gold, uh, one of the best overtaking spots. And then you've got the tricky sections at Verth and Roche Curve coming down through Yock and Rint Corner. Invalidation Central, Invalidation City down there, mate, my dad. You, Red Bull Ring are very conscientious of, of uh, track limits mm. and, and timing lines. So if you, if you stretch too far through turn nine, you're in deep trouble. So it's going to be a lottery, probably more so than what Saudi was. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> I am excited. But for now, we're going to have a little breather, have a break. Don't go anywhere because we will be back very shortly with some more interviews. And then, of course, we get straight back into it for qualifying in Austria. So don't go anywhere. Just grab a drink and then come right back with us. And we'll be back with you very shortly.
Well, we are back, and as you can see, I'm straight back with a guest, Barry, qualifying at the Jeddah Corniche like it. Done and dusted. Close. How are you feeling? Um, first, yeah, hello to everyone, and hope you guys are doing well. But yeah, the quality was, uh, of course, it, it would be a hard one. We all, I think, knew it because of the because of LAN and Jeddah, so many walls. You have to get super, super close to the walls, and... And yeah, it, it was really tricky. I think Q1 and Q2 was a little bit rusty, but in general, I was happy to go to Q3. And in Q3, I had only one run. I did some few mistakes. Uh, the big one was also, of course, the last sector. Uh, last uh, quite a bit, but still, I'm happy with P2. Uh, P2, P1 in Jeddah, quite similar. And but yeah, let's see what uh, what the race will bring for us. And GG to Freddy. Good luck to uh, good luck from him. Indeed. Now, of course, this is the first time that you guys are qualifying at Jeddah. What shocked you? What surprised you being out there? To be honest, uh, you guys can't imagine how <laughs> hard it is to qualify in Jeddah. Like in Q1 or Q2, every lapse counts. And if you do one tiny mistake you, or you're too wide, you're invalidating your lap or you're hitting the wall and um, it's out. You're out. So it was really, really tricky. I think one of the hardest quality in F1 eSport is in this track, I would call it. But yeah, I mean, at the end, uh, it was fine for me. And uh, yeah, it was unlucky for my teammate, Nico, but mm. I'm sure it, it could happen for anyone. And I'm sure he will bounce back in the race as he's uh, pretty good in the races and yeah. everything. Well, we hope so too. But P2 for you, that's fantastic. That's going to put you in a brilliant position for the race. How confident are you feeling? Because qualifying in the race are quite different, right? Qualifying, you're flat out. You're giving it your all. The race, there's a little bit more strategy at play there. You can bide your time a bit more. Yeah, well, um, I think in the races it's really crucial that uh, you don't uh, you be calm, uh, don't get track warning, don't hit the wall, of course. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm just gonna try to be calm, just gonna try uh, to listen to the team and uh, listen to their strategies. We put so many work in the strategy and everything, and I hope that they will do well. And um, I think it, hopefully everything should be fine. I hope so too. And now it's. Pause Jeddah for a moment and look ahead to Spielberg because we head over to qualifying in Austria. No rest for you guys, little breather and then straight back into it. How are you feeling going from a track that is so long, walls so tight to one that is a bit of a shorter track there? Uh, to be honest, I think Austria gonna be a gonna be a tough one. Not in terms of driving, but in terms of the gaps will be so close mm. because there is not really a skill gap in Austria. It's such a short track, easy track. Uh, it's going to be really tough, I would call it. But still, for now, I'm just as you as you said, uh, reset Jeddah, not like not happened, and fully focus on Austria. And hopefully, if I can get uh, P2 again, I will take it for sure. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Well, wishing you the best of luck, Barry. Thank you so much for chatting with us. That's me done over here. It's time to throw to Claire because she is with Lucas Blakely. Ariana, thank you so much. Well, the reigning champion alongside me. You fought hard out there for that fifth place qualifying position, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, Je that's the first time I've done Jeddah in esports, and my my goodness, it was, uh, yeah, it's so easy. I can't describe how easy it is to, you know, make a small, small mistake. I mean, you're getting so close to these walls. Every run, you're just trying to push that bit harder and harder, get on the power earlier. Yeah, it, mentally, it's one of the toughest qualifyings I think probably we've all had to sort of deal with, especially as you're going through Q1, Q2, you know, especially when you're, the cutoffs are so close as well, so... Lots of challenges to deal with. Um, to end up fifth after, you know, what was probably a little bit of a scrappy of Q3 when I've, would have, than I would have liked, um, I will absolutely take, because I think from fifth in Jeddah, you can you can certainly fight, because um, it's usually quite a hectic race. So hopefully we can, uh, yeah, keep a nose clean in that race and uh, go from there. That's the thing. That start's going to be a bit chaotic, isn't it? Yeah, I think there's just the way turn one and two funnel in, it's like so easy with, you know, what one minute you're on the inside, then it's the outside, then you've got a wall and it's very easy when you've got cars going two wide, three wide. Um, but yeah, for it to go wrong quite quickly. So naturally, I think hopefully everyone's going to be level headed going into the first few corners. Time will tell. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's going to be smart. You're going to have to make sure you get to lap 25. That's going to be the most important thing. Now we've got a completely different qualifying session coming up, a completely different track, and it is very different. Yeah. How are you feeling ahead of Austria? Uh, optimistic. I think, you know, naturally it is going to be dramatically different to jump from, you know, a high-speed street track where, you know, you're really thinking about you're not hitting walls to Austria where it's 
you've really got to, you know, the first sector's quite, the first sort of three, four corners are very braking orientated and then it's very high speed where you've got to watch your track, your track limits, you know, being one of the most important things. Um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how we, you know, all jump in and feel the rhythm. Um, yeah, we're all sort of just, that's the, the beauty of our LAN environment. We're all learning on the spot, um, adapting as we go. Um, it's certainly a challenge, you know, my, I mean, I don't know how many years I've been doing this sim racing thing now, but it's like, it doesn't, certain things don't ever get easier, but that's also what makes it feel like really rewarding. I mean, even in Q2 there to bang in a really good lap at the end, you know, you still get that, that, that feeling of, you know, pulling out something when you need it. And it's, you know, that's, you know, motivates you to keep pushing harder and harder. So hopefully we can keep doing that uh, going into Austria. And not to rub it in, but you don't have any points yet. It's very important, is it, this weekend, this this next couple of days, I keep thinking it's a weekend, next couple of days to, to get some points on the board. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite intense to think that in the next couple of days, half the season's finished. Mm -hmm. um, certainly a unique and new challenge, but something that, you know, look, we're all here to, we're all here to go racing. We're all looking forward to it. Um, and yeah, we are just... I think momentum is going to be quite a big part of that, given that you're just doing race after race, quality after quality. So that's, I think, what we're all trying to focus on. And hopefully, you know, if we perform at our best, I know we can deliver some good results. So that's where my focus is at. Well, Lucas, good luck. It's going to be exciting. This is a sim just behind us, so he's going to get ready, take his boots off and get into the sim. I think Ariana is out and about, though, and I think she should be alongside Alfie Butcher. That is correct. I have found my way down to Alfie. Alfie, how are you feeling after that qualifying? Uh, if I'm honest with you, I'm really buzzing. Uh, P3 is a great result. Um, as soon as I made it to Q3, I was really happy and uh, some of the pressure was relieved. Uh, but going into the last run, we were right near the front, so I was basically, I could just do the best lap I could and I had a little bit less pressure than some others perhaps. So, But yeah, I'm really looking forward to the race and uh, happy with the qualifying position. Lots of people talking about how difficult that qualifying session is at Jeddah. And that's coming from uh, drivers who have more experience than you, youngest uh, on the, the grid. How daunting did you find that qualifying session? Was it especially challenging or was it water for ducks back? <laughs> uh, no, it was a very intense and challenging session. Uh, we had some issues yesterday with the rig setup. Uh, but yeah, we definitely overcame them today. And uh, yeah, I just didn't think too much into being the youngest driver, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, if that, if anything, it kind of helps me because I have maybe less expectations, perhaps, for some people. But yeah, I'm really happy how it went. You've been quite the talk of the town in the F1 sim racing world at the moment because of how much talent you're showing, how much potential you're showing. Great performances in qualifying. Looking ahead to the race, how are you feeling about the race in Jeddah? Yeah, I think last time out in Bahrain, we learned a lot. Uh, we learned a lot with the strategy, and uh, I think that will reflect in the race later today. Uh, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. The pace looks really good, and we've got strategies planned out, so let's see how it goes. And we will be turning our attention very shortly to qualifying in Austria. As we've said a lot already, completely different type of track. Very short lap, not much in it. How are you feeling for that? Yeah, Austria is going to be very close, very tight. Um, it could rain, it could be dry, it's, we never know. But I'm um, definitely looking forward to it. Pace looks good in practice, so all we can do is give it our best and hope for another good qualifying and race. I'm loving it how cool, calm and collected you are. I'm absolutely loving it. Well done on a fantastic qualifying at Jeddah. No easy feat. Now, we have a little breather, a little break, and then it's time for these guys to hop back in to the Sims because when we come back, we'll be straight back into qualifying, but this time it will be at the Red Bull Ring. Don't go anywhere. Stick around. We're going to be back with qualifying in Austria very shortly.
We are back. Welcome back to qualifying. Day one at event two. Qualifying for Jeddah has been completed. Freddie Rasmussen taking pole position there. And now, lads, we turn our attention to qualifying at the Red Bull Ring. How are you feeling for Hayden? I'm so excited. If we fought the lap times, we're going to be close at Jeddah. Oh my God, they are going to be so close. Not just between the top three this time, but throughout the grid. It was like four temps separating first and 20th in Jeddah. It's going to be like half that, even less potentially here in Austria. Very different style of circuit. Jeddah, of course, one of our longer tracks, lots of corners, whereas Red Bull Ring in Austria, very short. Yeah, very much. Uh, maybe opposites attract. I don't know. Maybe. Um, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, I mean, uh, Austria again provides its own tests. There's more runoff, obviously. We don't have close walls here at Spielberg. But, you know, the dangers are there. The white lines this time are going to be the issue. And, and at the same time, some very tricky segments. Oversteer is going to be key as well, heading through turn three. So many drivers get it wrong from time to time. Some drivers will obviously, when it comes to race time, launch it up the inside there and also at turn four as well. But final sector is going to be massive. It is indeed. Now, how are these drivers going to be resetting after Jeddah and shifting their mindsets to such a different track? We can see they're all back mm -hmm. now in their sims, having a little practice. But how are they shifting the mindset? Well, it's going to be difficult for those who have come off the back of a more disappointing qualifying because, yes, you just got to put that to the back of your mind, but sometimes that can be difficult. Sometimes it just kind of looms around you for a little bit longer. And But those guys who have you know, put themselves off the front, Freddie Rasmussen, he's going to be feeling great. He's going to be thinking, okay, that's one mm. of the day. Let's go get another one. So it's going to be interesting to see the different dynamics between the drivers. But for them, they've done all the practice back at home. This is just going to be a little bit of warming up just to get themselves back in the groove. George, talk us through some of the key elements of this circuit and of a lap. You mentioned Sector 3, how crucial it is. What are the other bits that we should be keeping an eye out for? Well, Turn 1 as well. There's some race curbs uh, up the inside, which you've got to be very wary of. And if you get thrown out, uh, thrown out wide, because it's such an aggressive corner yeah. at Turn 1, and it's uphill in elevation, you can get pushed well out wide. The arrow kind of favours the left-hand side. There's more, should we say, sausage curbs on the left. Um, so balance is key uh, heading through Turn 1. But at the same time, you don't want to deviate away from pace. And then you've got the uphill climb through a, a blind turn two, which doesn't really exist, but turn three nonetheless comes up afterwards. Uh, 90 degrees right. It's tricky there. Again, track limits. And at the same time, being cautious and wary of oversteer. Slosh gold, very easy to get wrong as well. It's downhill. Obviously, when you get the, to the highest point, you then all of a sudden creep downhill. You need to try and keep it as wide as possible, then cut in deep. And again, we saw Alex Albon getting it wrong mm. uh, when he came together with Lewis Hamilton uh, only a few years ago. And uh, unfortunately, that was towards the closing stages of his time at Red Bull at that time. Yes, indeed. Now, we caught up with race engineer Brett Kosh recently. Let's have a little look at what he had to say. Delighted to be joined, first of all, by Brett Kosh from Williams. And obviously, what's also important, other than the driver, are the race engineers, those behind the scenes that make things happen. Brett, just talk to us about how important this role really is in ensuring that you push a driver's potential. Well, uh, it's critical to our infrastructure and the team. Um, without them, we wouldn't have the information, the data, the telemetry that we run. Um, and it would really mean that going into each race, we go in blind. And uh, when you're competing at this level, that's, that's not good for anyone. No, I mean, someone who is obviously behind the scenes trying to push their drivers, feeding the data through, uh, trying to obviously communicate to the drivers where they need to improve. I mean, you guys are essentially the centerpiece in many ways, right? Yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, it's the brains of the, the well-oiled machine. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not taking anything away from the other management um, within the team, you know, as a case of everybody needs to do the job 100%, but when it comes to racing and stuff, engineers is really, really important. Yeah, and in terms of the, the lineup Williams have uh, for this F1 sim racing event too that we are now in the midst of, uh, what are your hopes, what are your expectations? Is the confidence brimming at Williams Esports right now? Yeah, the confidence is brimming. Um, we're taking this, I mean, for, for a lot of us, it's our first debut event, um, but I'm confident we have all the skills, all the all the skill sets we, we need um, to put in a good big performance. You know, we've got Alvaro with the experience, we've got two rookies in our lineup of uh, Ismail and, and Will. Um, so yeah, the, it's it's a flame that's burning, uh, but hopefully it catches a bit more flame. 
Yeah, and honing new talent as well. When we look at, you know, characters such as Will Lewis and Alvaro Caraton, you've also got a very exciting driver in the name of, by the name of Ishmael Fassi as well. A lot of promise has definitely been shown from this young man. What is your view on his potential and, and also his trajectory over the next season or so? Look, I think for um, Ishmael, I mean, I've, I've worked with him for many years now. Um, and when I joined uh, Williams Esports, it was one of my first priorities uh, to bring him into the team. I knew the talent that he was. Um, I think now it is a case of we know the prospect he is. He's shown his ability, but what it's about is maintaining that, making it a sustainable career for him, and that, that's what's important for the man. Yeah, it's also important as well for our sim racing engineers to be on point too. Brett, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Always so great to hear from the different members of the team. Of course, attention is often focused on those in the sim, but this is a whole operation behind the scenes, and it's fantastic to hear from them. Nice little catch up there, George. Yeah, really enjoyable to talk to Brett because, like me, uh, he is someone who's come from league racing, and mm -hmm. um, I've had many a conversation with him. We've we've had many chats over the years, um, but. Uh, Coming from someone with his background, he is so valuable to, to Williams in the sense that he carries that weight from league racing, um, you know, regularly racing as well and analyzing data for drivers and using those skills and communication skills with his drivers. He, he takes that with such a high degree of pride. Um, it can only benefit their team. And we've looked at some of the performances that Ishmael has already managed to ramp up in Saudi Arabia. I mean, that Jeddah, uh, you know, for a debutant, that's stellar. It is indeed. P4 mm. is pretty impressive, isn't it, Hayden? Yes, certainly. He's had a really good run so far this season. Great qualifying in Jeddah, of course. And it's, it's really interesting to see those guys behind the scenes because strategy is so important. The drivers, they've done so much on this game that they know the strategy as well. But it's always good to get that insight to what the other teams are doing around them, where they're going to be. So it's so important to have those guys in their ears. And also just sometimes to, to big them up, reassure mm. them. You know, sometimes you might make a mistake and you can get inside your own head because one overtake another to overtake more cars getting past you but you just need that person to be like don't worry man you've got this let's get back in this race and sometimes that's all you need to get yourself back up the field indeed it's a real team effort this uh now we have just over five minutes until we get into qualifying so we want to know if you were enjoying yourself what you're up to please let us know what you're up to on social media we check it all, don't we? We have a little look. You can get in touch with us on all of the main social media platforms. Use the hashtag F1 Esports and tell us your thoughts and feelings about what you are seeing today. Now, qualifying in Jeddah is done and dusted. One guy who just missed out on Q3 was Nicholas Longay. We caught up with him earlier in the week. Let's see what he had to say. Hello, my name is Nicholas Longay and I drive for Scuderia Ferrari Esports team. It's been quite a while since the uh, last time we were in race week, so I'm very excited to get to get going again. Um, I think we've prepared as best as we possibly could have, and there's going to be six tracks, so it's going to be very hard uh, then to see how people have prepared as it's such a different um, format. Uh, in driving for Ferrari, uh, I think it's a dream come true for many, many of us in the world. I know uh, myself as a child and many other friends in, in my life have always dreamed to be part of a team like this. So I think it's only going to boost, uh, boost my confidence and hopefully I can deliver. Here comes Nicholas Longay to finish his first lap in Q3. Is it on a new set of tyres? It's a 27.4. It's a strong lap. In order to improve consistency, I think obviously rep repetition is obviously the main tip, but uh, just try and focus every single lap. You don't have to be 100, 101% pushing, but you can just be 99, 100% and, and stay within your, your limits. Then that's how you can find your consistency. I always set for myself every year is to just be better than the year before. I mean, that's how you just keep improving. And as in terms of a team's result or a goal, um, I really hope that me and Barry uh, can put a really good fight for the championship this year. I think we are very strong and uh, I'm sure you'll see us fighting for the top position. Fighting for top positions, that is exactly what Ferrari will be wanting. Now, we were speaking just then about how important it is to recognize the other people in the team. It's not all about the drivers. And I believe that Claire is out in the open down at McLaren. And I think she is speaking with Joel Chapman. Claire, tell us more. I am alongside Joel Chapman. Hello, Joel. Uh, we've got your drivers just practicing behind you as well. We spoke to Lucas Blakely before. A little wave there. You're meant to be paying attention to your sim. Uh, look, we spoke to Lucas earlier and he said ahead of, uh, after Jeddah rather, it was one of his hardest qualifying sessions he's ever had. He's probably looking forward to Austria now. 
Yes. Well, you can see he's in good spirits, uh, <laughs> turning around and uh, giving us a wave. No, I mean, naturally coming into an environment like this, this is a new environment for all drivers. Um, it's very different to their home or um, factory setups. So um, there's this natural adjustment period and um, drivers can be very sensitive to the smallest details um, with, with rigs and pedals and everything. So um, that was the first proper session we've had. And um, I mean, if he's uh, disappointed after a P5 result, then um, hopefully he's, uh, he's in, a, in a good place. Obviously, we've spoken about the reigning champion quite a lot, but your other driver was a rookie coming out in Bahrain, obviously a rookie for the whole season, but literally a rookie in F1 sim racing. Um, how impressive has he been so far? Super impressive. I mean, this is his second ever F1 sim racing race. Um, and to bounce back after Bahrain, which was, of course, a tough event for him. He's had a little bit of time between that race and coming into this race. So for him to deliver, that was a, a massive performance. I'm just so proud of him and delighted for him. He had a little break to kind of collect his thoughts and things. Did he come back a bit of a different driver? Yeah, if anything, it, it spurred him on. It made him more hungry. Um, I think it was a great experience for him to get that first opportunity to come into a, a LAN environment like this and do some racing. Um, he learned a great deal during that event. And the, the three, four months kind of between the two, yeah, he, he's worked so incredibly hard and deserves everything he's achieving right now. And then we threw him straight into Jeddah. Uh, let's look at Austria then. Um, your, your drivers know this track incredibly well. Um, Formula One fans around the world know this track incredibly well. What are you hoping from this session? Um, it's extremely different to Jeddah. Um, Jeddah is uh, obviously a fast flow street circuit. Um, we've got a slightly unique format here going quali quali, then race race. So the drivers really are going to have to adapt super fast to, to the different track conditions and um, not flowing from qualifying into races is, is, a, is a new thing for them. Um, yeah, we, we feel really confident coming into this. Um, we prepared this track as well as we prepared every other track and look, we looked um, really good, really strong in, a, in a qualifying uh, during Jeddah. So hoping for another strong result and to, be, to have both drives in Q3 is fantastic. Points on the board is so important at the moment for McLaren Shadow. Yes, precisely. We, we had a, a fantastic season last year, but that was last year. Um, you know, it's a new season ahead. Um, we were disappointed after Bahrain, but um, encouraging start so far. So just looking forward to the race and uh, yeah, the race later. That's obviously where the, the points are scored. So hoping for a good quality now and then uh, point scoring in the race. Well, you've got a qualifying session to go get ready for. So Joel, I'll let you go. Ariana, back to you. Thank you very much. Lovely to hear from Joel. Sounding very composed there and feeling quite confident, it sounds, in his team, which is completely to be expected as he has the reigning world champion sitting uh, just beside him. Now, looking ahead to Spielberg, this is a track that we often get different conditions in, um, which can play a massive part. How are the drivers going to be dealing with that, the team? Because you've got to keep it in the back of your mind, haven't you? Jeddah, not really worried about the rain too much there. No, you just got to, got to react to what's going on around you. So they're going to load up into the session, judge whether it's going to be wet or dry. Mm -hmm. If it's dry, it's a bit more of a simple. Intermediates, of course, they will be used at the start, but they're not going to be setting any you know, competitive lap times on. Then it's just soft tyres till the end. But if there is a bit of rain in the air, then they're going to have to time their out laps and when they actually go for their fast laps to perfection because you want those ideal conditions. You don't want to wait until it gets too wet and then you're... You're going to be lacking behind out in Q1, but you want to maybe try and go as late as possible if it is drying up to be right when the track is at its fastest. And as Joel was just talking about there, different for the drivers getting into this mindset of qualifying, qualifying, break, race, race. Qualifying is so intense. We hear um, our F1 drivers talking about it all the time. It's, it's an well, in F1, it's an hour slot where you are really full focus, flat out. Whereas the race, you have a bit more of a breather, a bit more strategy, you're pushing, you're planning. How is this going to affect the drivers having two qualifyings back to back? Uh, yeah, it's going to be an intense one. Uh, and I think on many levels, uh, I mean, the track itself is so short and, and fraught with danger. And then at the same time, you're coming off the back of a, uh, a qualifying session at a vastly different circuit where it, com where it comes down to Jeddah. But here uh, at Spielberg, I, I suppose they'll take solace knowing that it is a short lap. Uh, at the same time, only 10 corners to deal with. They've got to try and take it in their stride. Just be wary of what's ahead of you. Uh, I mean, like you say, changeable conditions. Yeah. Uh, you know, being up in the Styrian mountains, you get, you get plenty of it. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, these are professionals, and uh, I'd fully expect that they've been practicing this circuit time and time and again. Important to note as well, this is our fifth visit to this circuit as opposed to Jeddah, which was a first time for everyone in F1 sim racing. Absolutely, and that makes a big difference, I think. Having the knowledge, of course, of the track, huge, huge benefit. Someone that does consistently well around here is Freddie Rasmussen, mm. and of course, he's kicked off his day very well with uh, pole position. What do you reckon for his chances? 
Well, he's on 16 now. Let's see if he can make it 17. As I've said before, he's very consistent, and consistency is going to be great in this sort of environment. So you expect to see him up at the front. But, you know, it's going to be very close. One small error and losing like a hundredth of a second can put you quite a bit down the standings. So you need to be right on it. So it's going to be interesting to see where all these guys play out. But, yeah, you can't not back Freddie at the end of the, end of the day. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit as well about Thomas Ronhart. Of course, victory in Bahrain, successful at uh, the Red Bull Ring in the past as well. But in qualifying in Jeddah, slightly off the pace, do we think he'll be able to bring it back for uh, this quali set, qualifying Definitely session? possible. I I'd imagine you probably would have assessed with his team prior uh, after the post qualifying at Jeddah and sort of thought, well, we need to find a way of coming back here because th there's no way we can mount a title charge you know, staying the way we are. But uh, what I will say, if you look historically at Jed, um, at Austria, sorry, we haven't had any more than one race winner at this circuit. There's one guy though who's consistently in the theme, and that is Rasmussen, who you alluded to, mm -hmm. second place every year yeah. running uh, in the four in the four races we have had here. Truly remarkable. That is quite impressive, isn't it? That's uh, <laughs> that's quite something. But of course, P2 is not what he's going to be wanting. He's going to be wanting that victory. Uh, but before we even get to victory, we're getting ahead of ourselves because we still have qualifying <laughs> to go. As I mentioned before, make sure you let us know how much you're enjoying uh, F1 Sim Racing. Being back with the hashtag F1 Esports. I just had a little look while Claire was interviewing. So I'm keeping an eye on it. I can see what you're all saying. And Claire is ready for us once again. Claire, who have you found? The tallest man in the world, Danny Berezne alongside me. Not racing today, we'll be racing uh, tomorrow. Uh, we're just going to wander over towards your sim. Um, how are you feeling? Is it a bit weird to be watching from the sidelines today? Yes, it is. Uh, I'm a racing driver at the end of the day, but I have two fantastic teammates and it is a team sport all about the Constructors' Championship. And when you have an event with six races in only three days, which never happened before in esports, you need to put the team power together and uh, split out the tracks uh, to maximize performance. I was speaking to one of the drivers last night and he said there's a, there's a good and a bad thing about this because you can't touch your sim, so you can't feel guilty for not going out there and, and racing as much as you can and practicing. So, but does it feel weird not to be out there practicing? Yes, it feels, but tomorrow I will have my chance to shine or do uh, whatever result I, I can deliver. And for me, obviously, personally, only that matters, but any kind of result the team gets, I know that back at the factory behind closed doors, I also uh, put a little bit to it because we are all testing together, uh, trying to find the last hundreds of a second together, playing with the setups, and I will be really proud of them if they perform great today. Yeah, um, well, obviously one of your, your teammates, uh, Jano Otmir, didn't quite have the qualifying session he was expecting out in Jeddah. Lots of people out there wondering why maybe he didn't quite get it together on in Q2. Could you talk us through a little bit of what you saw? Yeah, so Jeddah is a street track. You need to have confidence. And the field improved quite a lot from the first shots of uh, Q2 to the second one. And Jano probably took it a bit cautious. But at the end of the day, it's only one lap and sometimes mistakes can happen. But uh, you can score big points in the race. He showed in the past that he can even win from P17. So I don't think this is a bad qualifying result for him because I'm really certain that he will do a lot better when there will be more laps to show his skills. And we've got Austria to come up next. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Lots going on. Well, Danny, thank you so much for joining us. We'll speak to you tomorrow, I'm sure. Ariana. Thank you very much, Claire. Lovely to hear there from Danny. And guys, it's time for me to leave you again. And that only means one thing. That means qualifying is upon us. Going to leave it to the pros. Take it away. Bravo, Ariana. Much appreciated. And uh, we'll look ahead now to the Styrian Mountains, Mr. Gullis, from the, one of the longest circuits on the calendar to now one of the shortest. And what, a track that we've been to, as I said before, four times already. This is our fifth visit. No driver has ever won here twice historically around this circuit of Red Bull Ring. Has had many former names as well. The Osterreich Ring, the A1 Ring, of course, now known in the modern era as the Red Bull Ring. Reopened back in May of 2011. Of course, originally opened back on the 26th of July 1969 and looking back historically we've had many great drivers take victories here including two champions Jana Watmir and David Tanitza but like I said no driver has ever won here twice Here's a look at the track 2.683 miles that's 4.318 kilometers still three DRS zones here despite the vastly shortened circuit but still the hazards run deep here Hayden yeah certainly and the biggest hazard in this qualifying session will be that of 
invalidating your lap time. It's so easy to run over those white lines because you're just carrying so much speed around this corner. Turn one, you're gonna be kind of penalized by the sausage curb on the outside, but you could easily cut on the inside. Turn three as well, or if you don't wanna count that little kink, turn two, heading up the hill. Again, one that you're not really going to invalidate because you're not likely to be outside wide there, but heading down into the last two corners, you are full commitment all the way through there. And all it takes is just one slight millimeter, the other side of that white line, it's all over for you. But we've got a couple of drivers out on track. On the intermediates, it doesn't look like it's raining at the moment. Looks it overcast. Looks, looks overcast, it is overcast, but I can't see any rain out on track. So uh, we're just getting the intermediates on at the moment, just to, again, make sure nothing has changed since they got out of the rigs. Maybe they, when they got out of the rig, they could have knocked something and the, the, the pedals aren't working, the steering wheel isn't working. So we're just gonna be testing this now, but obviously don't want to use a set of soft tires, but I, I will keep on pushing this, all right? Let's put them all out on intermediates at the start, all push for one point and let's have some fun. Love that, the Intermediate Tire Championship in full swing. Uh, Jed Norgrove, uh, one of the first to make his way out on track. Someone who I think shocked many back at Bahrain with such mm. an illustrious performance. Was very much a wall of defence, I would say, yeah. for Alpha Tauri, but he impressed nonetheless, Hayden. Yeah, I think really impressed. I think he kind of went under the radar because we were talking a lot about Alfie Butcher in the build-up and obviously he had a great qualifying performance and Jed just all of a sudden was was up there fighting for some amazing positions. Qualifying was a little bit more disappointing last time around as we were in Jeddah, but you know, this is a different track. This is a different mindset. Forget about that now. Go full out. Wilson Hughes there coming into the pits. Uh, very strong. This is one guy who did manage to bounce back from Bahrain. Obviously, there's a bit more time difference between that. Bahrain was six, four, five, six months ago. So it's a lot easier to get out of that mindset and prepare yourself for this event. But uh, Jed Norgrove has to do that in such a small amount of time. But these guys, they put the effort in. They put so much effort in back at home. And I'm sure they can push that to the side. Yeah, I'm sure they can. Barry Burraman, who we're currently watching on screen too. Still a lot of cars haven't ventured out for even an intermediate tie lap. But this is very similar to what we saw back at Jeddah too. Obviously, the driver's favouring to try and conserve tyres and wait till the very end. Obviously, I don't think track conditions are necessarily a major concern right now. They're obviously looking ahead, maybe hoping for better conditions as the track warms up later, later into the session. Yeah, I'd imagine if they saw some rain on the radar that they'd be getting yeah, straight out there away. straight away yeah. on the soft tyres and, and not worry about these intermediate runs at the start. But uh, Simon Vigang looks like he's going to give us something to look at. He is on the intermediate tyres, but let's uh, see how he does. Obviously, it's a bit more difficult. You're going to actually have more grip in the first couple of corners because you have that extra extra traction and extra um, tread on the tyre to get yourself through the first couple of corners. But then after that, they're just going to overheat. You're going to be understeering. It's not not worth pushing these because if you push it, you make a mistake, you crash out of qualifying or because you were just going for glory on the intermediate. That for, for nothing at the moment, you're going to look like a bit of a fool. But uh, Simon Vigang just taking it easy, just enjoying the views here around in Austria on the intermediate tyres. It's a great circuit, a lot of rise and fall and a lot of beautiful nature around the outside. There's lots of wonderful nature around Styria. I've had the pleasure of visiting it myself a couple of times already and uh, it certainly does bear witness to some great racing and historically um, some, you know, <laughs> crazy situations where it comes to conditions because we are effectively up in the mountains. As now Simon Vigang makes his way in towards the latter sector. Looks like he's going to be bailing on this lap because he's hugging very tight to the inside, taking the pit in road uh, out of the Jochenring curve and now heading through the uh, well, stop and I need to make sure, of course, during the race that you get into the necessary speed, because otherwise you will sustain a penalty. But Vigang opting to come back in, obviously, again, not concerned about conditions. Yeah, he was uh, coming into the pits there. I noticed that he was either testing his gears and just making sure they were working, because he was going up and down quite a few of them, or he's just trying to make a little tune with the engine sounds, because it was uh, quite nice to listen to. It was. Uh, great to also see a car out on track. Like, again, consistent theme to what we've seen historically. Simon Vigan's career has actually been quite vast. Came in at the pro draft uh, for Renault uh, back in the day. He was actually teammates with Jana Watmir mm -hmm. and uh, also Cedric Tomei uh, back in the day. Eventually, of course, uh, Jano and Cedric would move to Mercedes. Uh, Simon would move to Haas. They parted ways eventually, and now he is since washed up here. I wouldn't say washed up. Yeah, that's, a bit harsh. Harsh. that's a bit harsh. <laughs> I'm sorry, Simon. <laughs> uh, apologies to Serge Gnabry there. Uh, I, I'd hate to see him uh, <laughs> come up to me with that handlebar moustache and the, uh, that that he's donning right now. I could be in a lot of trouble. Simon Vigang is one person you do not you want know. to defend because uh, I'm pretty the sure he is the strongest. Although, I was in the gym <laughs> with him the other day, and he was sat chatting to Josh Edo for a good 30 minutes, and I think I saw them do about one set each in that whole time. <laughs> so, I don't know. 
<laughs> well, he's actually marked an appearance in the gym, which is more than could be said for me. So okay, he's got one on me on that. So uh, we didn't know watching Ishmael Fassi make his way out on an outlap as well. It's someone who has really impressed us uh, off the back of Jeddah. Very different circuit here, though. Um, maybe doesn't akin to Fassi's strengths. Uh, in terms of racing, tends to do extremely well in street circuit environments, maybe less elevation. Uh, we'll have to see how he copes here with, with Austria, but um, an unknown quantity, because we haven't seen him much bar the opening two rounds. But what we have seen, from, well, certainly from what we can take from the sandy circuit, shall we say, at Bahrain <laughs> and Jeddah, it, it looks promising. Maybe he just loves sand. Maybe that's maybe. what it is. He just loves a bit of sand as he uh, runs a little bit wide there, but again, just on the intermediate tyres, everybody building up. The, the, the thing is with Austria, it's such a short lap around here. So we've actually got what feels like longer time before we see those fast laps because they can go a lot later. But Simon Weigang, he is out on the soft. So we're going to get our first soft runner lap here with Simon Weigang. He's out on the out lap at the moment. So he's just going to be building up those tyre temperatures. As it is a shorter lap, there is less time to do that. So you need to really make sure you're in the groove you're getting those tyres up to temperature by slamming on the brakes and hitting the throttle at the same time. Yeah, we know how physical Simon is, uh, certainly as a specimen, as a driver as well. Uh, doesn't mind a scrap out on track, and I'm sure he'll be looking to try and bring his very best. He's spoken to me as well about the intense hours he has put into this. He actually showed me his hands, and uh, we could display that actually this, his skin was shedding away with the amount of hours that he had spent mm. on, the, on the sim. So credit to him, he's put the work in. And Aston Martin have had, um, so far, a reasonable day with Fabrizio Donoso uh, stepping up and claiming a top 10 in great style at Jeddah. Different driver, though, in alongside Simon. It's John Evans, debutant from last season, Hayden. Yes, yeah, certainly, but not in... Uh, oh, no, he is in the rig today. I, I, I didn't know. I thought it was Fabrizio Donoso. But no, there he goes. He is in the rig uh, alongside Simon Vigang. Interesting dynamic, because obviously Fabrizio Donoso had such a strong performance in Jeddah, whereas Simon Weigang wasn't quite as up there. He was out in Q1. But maybe that is going to be the benefit to those teams who are happy to chop and change their drivers because Fabrizio Donoso could have put all that effort into Jeddah. Now Evans can put all the effort into Austria and you can really maximize that. Whereas Simon's had to practice for two circuits in such a short amount of time. And we're not even talking about the later four circuits that we've got tomorrow and the day after that. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you look at the, the two drivers themselves, uh, they'll be looking to come back fighting. Uh, I mean, John Evans had uh, a debut season that wasn't necessarily ideal, uh, seven races, and even he would admit that it didn't really go to plan, but still at the same time, it's a renewed season, new season, new challenges, and a new format as well to boot. And you've got to bear in mind, I mean, we've got a six race event period here this week, so it's very intense. You know, it's no question that some teams are going to opt to swap drivers in and out. But if you look back at John Evans's history, uh, I mean, as a league racer, competed at the highest level on Xbox as well, was one of the uh, large major names uh, in the world of F1 gaming and has uh, since transitioned into F1 sim racing and has done so brilliantly, uh, has a lot of promise, a lot of ability. Uh, it's just a case of putting it out there. And even he admitted to me whilst we were uh, obviously chatting at the hotel earlier on today, that the gaps are minute between the drivers. But Simon Weigang, again, this time on soft, yeah. opted to come in early. Yeah, that was strange. It's just kind of like bailed out at last minute. So I'm not too sure whether he may be invalidated at the end of that lap time there. And just thought, okay, cool, this is done. I, I made a mistake. They fell back into the pits. But here we're watching on board with you, Lass. And uh, he is doing that technique. So he's on the brake. He's on the throttle at the same time. You want to build up your tyre temps. We can't see that because that graphic is hidden at the moment. But you want to be building your tyre temps up to about 90 to 93 degrees Celsius. And if you're in Fahrenheit, 194 to 199. But so uh, we're watching on board now with you, Lass, coming through the final corner. And let's ride on board with a lap for our first lap around Austria. As you rise up the hill, going into turn one, and you can just look at the concentration on his face. A little bit of correction on the steering wheel, maybe got it out a little bit a tad wide on the curb to correct the steering wheel there, as Ulis will be rising now in towards the second corner and then into the tight hairpin of turn three. If I turn around, I can see it behind me. There he is, and he's uh, going now down in towards turn four. It looks like he's pulling over to the right-hand side, but I think he's still on a hot lap, not invalidated just yet. Uh, no, he is conserving the battery. You can see the red light is flashing. So Ulas must have made a mistake on that first corner, now conserving battery. So he won't be going for a lap on this one. No, Ulas is Ildrim, of course, also a versatile driver. He's actually driven GT3 cars as well in a virtual sense and is now trying to transition those skills into F1 sim racing. He was also very talented and uh, 
made a huge impact in the Challenger Series, the same season that this man, Alfie Butcher, would go on to take the title. And you last, from my perspective, watching him, I earmarked Australia for uh, you last as one of the really coming of age moments uh, where, of course, he managed to pull out this truly bizarre, but it worked, undercut strategy. Uh, that really brought himself to the forefront as we now watch Alfie Butcher trying to leave everything out on the circuit right now up towards the line. What can he muster? Goes fastest with a 103, 144. His teammate Ulas quite a ways off the pace. Yeah. Thomas Ronha immediately going to the top now and drums in a faster lap that's only 1,000 quicker than Alfie Butcher. Blimey, uh, uh, you could barely put, fit a paper clip through that gap there. You know? <laughs> we are coming up with more and more expressions for that. It's incredible. <laughs> but yeah, Alfie Butcher, only one thousandth of a second. And there goes Barry Borman. So yeah, Ulas just made that mistake into turn one. Must have run it out wide there. And unfortunately, that's cost him. And he's going to have to definitely use a new set of tyres. John Evans, here we go through the last couple of corners. Doesn't invalidate the first one. Cuts along the corner on the inside. Runs it right onto the white line. Coming onto the last corner. Crosses the line. And there's going to be P5 for him. But at the back end of those guys who have set valid laps. Times. Wilson Hughes crossed the line, a 103, so that puts him uh, in towards P6 at the moment. Our reigning champion, Lucas Blakely, will come across the line. Can he put it on top? No, he can't, but he is ahead of his teammate. Yeah, Nicholas Longay, I think, uh, taking a bit of a wider line as well. It's not perturbed in those third fastest for the 103, 146. These initial times, obviously, at the very start, we'll soon uh, witness them depleting because, of course, uh, they'll be putting in one more run uh, before the timer ticks to zero. Here comes the artist, Ishmael oh, Fassi, running very it. wide. I think he's managed to hold on, yep. though, as he now crosses the line and goes into fifth fastest, but no doubt would have lost a little bit yep. of time through that final sector. So, not an ideal visit. Caratong goes third fastest. Of course, a race win, a uh, pole city here, should I say, back uh, not too long ago and has actually held some uh, great results historically. Here comes the all-star Jake Benham, who managed to achieve a top 10 in our previous qualifying session at Jeddah. See if Lightning can strike twice here, Jake. But first of all, you need to get out of Q3, uh, Q1, my friend, before you even think about venturing into Q3. Coming through now, the final two corners, turn nine into turn 10. The Red Bull Mobile curve now lighting up as the Mercedes looks to penetrate, comes up towards the line. He can't penetrate. He still remains in the elimination zone. No need to panic just yet. He's got a banker on the board anyway. Yeah, but just look how close the lap times are. One tenth, two tenths separating from Josh Edu all the way down to uh, Pedre, Pedre, Pedre Reino. Got there in the end. Uh, down in P15, which is right on the cusp there. So it is, like I say, it's going to be so tight between the whole field that, yes, okay, your first lap, not the best one. You're not up at the top of the field. Thomas Ronhard, though, feels like he's very happy with that and thinks he's not going to be beaten. It'll be interesting to see what Josh does and whether he follows suit as well. Alfie Butcher in the box. He's only 1,000th of a second off of Thomas Ronhard. And then 1,000th behind that, you've got Alvaro Caraton. And then 1,000th behind that, you've got Nicholas Longay. So it'll be interesting to see if, you know, Ronhard thinks he's safe. Do those guys think they're safe? Well, it's a good question. Uh, Philip Prejnade are not having uh, an ideal time either. Of course, rejoining the world of F1 sim racing through Alpine. Uh, coming in, obviously, after the departure of Luke Smith, I did allude to Silly Season earlier on in the broadcast. Josh Edo, great start, uh, getting underway. The initial lap being the fastest. And like I said earlier on, someone who is not too dissimilar of achieving pole laps. Uh, of course, looking back, he's done it at Imola. He did it at Yas Marina last season. Of course, the final race of the season, you couldn't end in a better way, apart from winning the race. But he himself, up at the sharp end, ahead of Thomas Ronha as well. Red Bull are looking very nicely prepared in this, should we say, the first two sessions of this event so far. Yeah, and they've got a fantastic driver lineup over there. Freddie Rasmussen and Josh Edo. We both know the, the capabilities of those drivers. And yes, OK, Josh was P7 in qualifying and not quite at the heights of his teammate. And you'd be hoping, oh, let's maybe see the, both the Red Bulls up at the top. But... It's such fine margins between these that it could have just been one corner or maybe not as close to this barrier here. But he's put himself in the mix and Jed is going to be one of those tracks where overtaking's quite easy around there. This one might be a little bit more difficult. Yes, you've got long straights, but it's such a short circuit. And they're all going to be bunched together. It's Brendan Lee psyching himself up for the final laps. So you've got three minutes left on the clock at the moment. Not a lot of drivers out on track. There are a couple who are just venturing onto the track right now, but Lucas Blakely looking very, very calm. It looks like he's one of those drivers who is out on track. And as I turn around, it is Lucas Blakely heading down into turn four at the moment. Yeah, I, I'm, I had a little chuckle to myself because I'm looking at the live timing again. And if you look at the top nine, uh, all within 88,000 of a second, that is nuts. I don't think I've ever seen it that vast. Uh, I you mean, take we... Josh out of the picture though, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, the rest of them are separated by 
10 thousandths, yeah. less than well, that. You can take 20 thousandths off the, off the 88 thousandths, so that's like another level <laughs> altogether. I mean, I mean, credit to Josh Edo, first of all, 19 thousandths, you know, it just goes to show that every thousandth counts. Mm. I mean, we saw it earlier on with um, Alfie Butcher and Thomas Ronha. Of course, he was only 1 thousandth off Ronha uh, as he currently sits P3 uh, in the timing tower. As we now watch Blakely uh, hurtle around at this next left. Uh, historically, for Lucas, uh, it's not been a bad time around Austria, third place last year, sustained a podium, and going off the theme of the fact that we've had, you know, four different winners so far around this track, Tanitza, Kiefer, as well as Otmir last season, Thomas Ronha, uh, there's a great opportunity <laughs> here for Blakely to, to essentially right the wrongs of the last four years. So basically, if you haven't won a race, this is your time this to win a race to around Austria. Absolutely. But, but here we go. At the end of Q1, this is the moment to see who's going to get through into Q2. On board with Lucas Blakely as he rises up the hill in towards turn one. It's going to get hard on the brakes and throw it through the right-hander. Use a little bit of the inside curve. Don't go on that yellow sausage on the outside. He just touches it with a wheel. That's perfect. This is great timing from him, taking a bit of a slipstream from that. I think it was an Aston Martin ahead of him now. Now hard on the brakes. He'll get the car over to the left to utilize as much of the track as he possibly can. Touch the apex on the inside, extend the car out wide, and then get back over to the throttle. Keep it the shortest distance to turn four. A little bit over to the right, then back over to the left. Hard on the brakes, about just after the 100 meter board. You want to drift the car ever so slightly through turn four to get that extra rotation through the corner. Hug the right and then set yourself up for this brilliant double left hander as you rise down the hill here in Austria. A few little, little bits of traffic there, but he managed to avoid that. Good timing. No little bit of slipstream, though, like he had earlier on. Back on the throttle and now into where it can all fall away from you. You could be up as he is, double purple sectors. But if he runs it a tad wide, it's going to be all over. Cut the inside, perfect on the exit, down to the line, and that surely is going to put him right to the front. But it doesn't. It's a bad sector three, and it's only P9. Yeah, and I tell you what, that's far from safe, I would argue, Hayden, at this point. 45 seconds remaining on the clock now as we watch Ulash Ozildirim come up towards the line. Now he goes fast. It's great time from Ulash Ozildirim. A 103-110 that almost will secure safety the way this is carried out, but there's still plenty of cars out on track. Brendan Lee now making his way around, way off the pace at this stage, but he might fit in one last run. The timer is still active, 22 seconds remaining. It's all down to you, Brendan Lee. I'm just looking at the bottom end of things as well. Prejnado still at the very back. Wilson Hughes, too, as we're now watching Jet Norgrove, who impressed back at Bahrain fairly recently. Currently P7 in the timing tower. 39 thousandths off the time at the top as well as he now goes and stays seventh fastest. Brendan Lee now about to venture onto another lap and he's timed it to the precise second. Just about got that lap time in there. He failed on the first attempt. Now he's going to go again. Yoni Tormala comes across the line. He puts himself into P11. Oh, it is so close up at the top there with Barry Borman finished uh, oh. there through as well. Who's looking like they're out? Presnader, only P17 down there. Freddie Rasmussen across the line. Currently puts it in pole position. Yeah, fantastic lap from Rasmussen now. Gone at, he's jumped ahead of Longay, who set up 103.057. Ishmael Fassi, the artist, he's in danger. 15th place, right on the bubble of elimination. Can Pedreño unseated? Can Vigang unseated? They're on laps. John Evans is out. Fassi's out. Blakely is on the bubble himself. Such a key final lap for him. I'm looking further up the order. Mercedes galvanized off the back of a disappointing run for Otmir in Q2 in our previous session. Ulas, though, all but secured in P5. Drama, though, Brendan Lee just barely staying in contention, remains P12 and also looking further down. God, McLaren were lucky, Hayden. Yeah, definitely. A little bit of a lifeline there for Brendan Lee as well to uh, not have to worry about that final lap. Came across the line with some good timing there. But uh, once again, Alpine, sadly not a good day for them. I was hoping that they'd be able to bounce back, maybe put a little bit more effort into Austria. But sadly, uh, maybe that's not the case. Down at the bottom, 19 for 20 once again. And Aston Martin, whilst we saw Donoso rising in qualifying in Jeddah, Sally for John Evans and Simon Vigang, both of them out in Q1. And a bit of a surprise there for Fassi, a great qualifying in Jeddah. Maybe that's why he had such good qualifying, because he put a lot of effort into that track. Maybe not as much here into Austria. Sadly for him, he is out. But yeah, like you say, very, very lucky for both Williams drivers. But, you know, just because they're down there in Q1 doesn't mean that they're going to be in the danger zone in Q2. They could easily get into Q3, because it's so close. Well, remember, I mean, the pole shootout is where it all happens in Q3. It's just a case of getting through each session before you can even reach that point. But um, yeah, a tale of two teams, a tale of two drivers. It's Alpine and Aston Martin. 
And Ishmael Fassi, who uh, obviously another surprise as well, not mm -hmm. making it through. Uh, but then again, we've alluded to the issues that present themselves around this track. It, it, just one mistake, Caden, will we'll punish you. Yeah, definitely, because, you know, look how tight, close the timings are. 27,000 separate the top two, but going all the way down to, to P15, uh, it's just so close. And, you know, it's so close down there. Two, three tenths of a second was what is down there. And I believe Claire has gone and found one of our drivers. Claire, who have you got? I've got Ishmael. George was just saying that it was such a surprise to see you knocked out. And I have to agree, it's such a surprise to see you here. Well, just talk us through what happened. Well, uh, I was coming through for a good lap to get you into Q2. I just messed up the last two corners and lost quite a lot of time. And yeah, didn't get through by six thousands, I believe. But yeah, um, the grid is close. You cannot make uh, any mistakes. And that's what happened to me. Uh, I just didn't get the right last two corners and got knocked out. Just shows how tight the margins are in, in F1 sim racing, doesn't it? Yeah, um, like I said, like everyone says, the grid is very close and you cannot do any mistakes, like I said before. Um, after uh, after the penultimate corner, I saw that I missed the apex by quite a lot, and I said I'm not getting through. <laughs> so, yeah, um, the race is quite different. Um, a lot can happen. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Are you feeling a bit frustrated, or is it a bit of a shake it off moment and just kind of get on? We've got races to go. Um, I know pace is there. Uh, Austria is kind of will be kind of like Jeddah. Um, strategy will matter a lot. So, yeah, um, back in Bahrain, I started 15 and I got points. So could happen again. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what we're excited to see you racing out there today. Uh, unfortunately, it's P16 here. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, CC, and uh, great insights there on Ishmael Fassi, and probably uh, something that we've actually, bone of contention, turns nine and ten, that's exactly mm. where Fassi got it wrong. Uh, I mean, quite rightly, uh, I, he didn't say it, but you could just tell the reaction on his face, bitterly disappointed, uh, because Jed, it, looking back at Jeddah, so great. He alluded to Red Bull Ring being very similar. He could effectively lose points off the back of this. Certainly so, and, and, and you said it about the last two corners. Because you're carrying so much speed through those last two corners, it's so easy to get that overspeed, that understeer, and just drag yourself like a millimetre too wide. And, and what happened to him is he took a little bit too much on the last corner, cut it a little bit too much, it then allowed him to extend on the final corner on the outside of that. And he did get lucky not to invalidate on that lap, but he would have backed off on the throttle, and that's of course going to lose you time because you're not full throttle like all the other drivers are. But you need to be close to perfect. And whoever is going to be closest to perfect is going to be the driver that puts himself on pole position, more so around a track like this. You go to somewhere like Spa, it's a very long lap, there's a lot of corners, a slight mistake at a corner, but you could maybe have better than your personal best at another corner to gain that lap time. Here it's very, very difficult to do that. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of conversations, certainly after the back of the Japanese Grand Prix in real life, Hayden, when we talk about understeer, and obviously Logan Sargent, don't want to brandished the banner of irony here, but obviously he was driving the Williams mm -hmm. as well, and uh, the understeer incident that he had in free practice. Again, uh, you've carried the speed too yep. hot, you're going to make a mistake going, going up through. And turn seven at Suzuka's no different to turns nine and ten here at Austria. Uh, Alvaro Caraton, though, one-legged in the Williams team. Yes, yeah, certainly, but now all focus is going to be on him for the team. So at least it makes it a little bit easier for the guys uh, who are behind the desk because they only have to focus about one driver now. But they're definitely going to have to be getting their, their notebooks out and going through strategy later on for the race. We're seeing something very similar to uh, what we saw last time around. All the drivers out on track and uh, some of them will be setting lap times and some of them will just be testing their, their stuff just to make sure everything's in order or get themselves in the right eye, ready for this uh, Q2 session as we head through the final corner. Now, will Caraton finish the lap? Yes, he will. He is going to finish the lap through the final corner and uh, not do what his teammate did, run out wide there. He keeps it right on the white line. It's a 103.1. It is a very decent lap time, but that certainly has to be on used tyres. Yeah, Alvaro Caraton at the top. Alfie Butcher goes second fastest, just in behind. So in the initial, getting those in it, oh, those first laps in. Yanni Tormala doing the same, a 103.287. Situates him just in behind Butcher. Tormala, who has had podiums in his own right in the past. Thomas Ronha, who uh, was blistering back at Bahrain. And uh, I think well, they've got good promise heading into Jeddah. They'll want to try and figure the same here this time around as we see Nicholas Longe once again going to the top. And he's proven that he is still up there with the pace. But Rasmussen once again typifying it in his favour this time. Just seems to be the case that it's constantly those three names at the top. Rasmussen, Longe and Caraton here at Austria. Yeah, Rasmussen just always at the top. Come on, man. Give someone else a chance. What's <laughs> going on here? He's absolutely flying. I just wanted to note Thomas Ronhart on that flying lap then. Picked up a fan 
fantastic slipstream from the car ahead all the way down in towards uh, turn two, three. So it's going to be interesting to see what lap time he can put in because he hasn't actually completed a lap here. But there's uh, Freddie Rasmussen at the top of the timing sheet. So 103.0. I'm sure we're going to potentially sneak into the 102s at some point for sure, right? You would expect so. Rasmussen, of course, laying claim off the back of Jeddah. His 16th pole position through the entirety of his F1 sim racing career. It all started back in 2018 with Alpha Tauri, where he got signed by them. Part of the Red Bull family, he's remained there ever since. And uh, alongside Yoni Tormler, one of the bastions, the main bastions of that team. And uh, we'll be looking forward, obviously, to yet another stellar Q3, providing he can get through it. But obviously, based on what we're currently seeing right now, it's looking like it's all Freddy at this point. Longay, though, just in behind, will be giving him a few reminders, just saying, listen, mate, I'm here. Um, I've got a feeling we're going to see some times well within the 102s here. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, for Longay, though, it's interesting to see that he's uh, he's up there this time around. Obviously, got knocked out last time in Q2 in Jeddah, so uh, he'll be wanting to bounce back from that and put himself right at the, up, up to the front. But, of course, just because you've got a good banker lap in doesn't always mean you can guarantee it on it. We have seen in the past where some people think that they're safe, retire from the session, and it comes back to bite them. They get knocked out in Q2 or, or, or Q1. So you do have to make sure you get your timings absolutely right. Two people who did get their timings right, of course, were one of them was Alfie Butcher. He retired from the session or, or didn't go out for a second run. He has got a spare set of soft tires available to himself, either whether he wants to use them in this Q2 session or save them for later and has that confidence to get into Q3. So that's going to be one to watch later on. Yeah, the light cloud still remaining with us for now, so no changes, but it's looking a little brighter yeah, in comparison definitely. to Q1. So I don't think we've got any two major concerns. Get the concerns. sunnies on. Get the sunnies on, why not? Yeah, I've got them <laughs> in my bag, so we'll, we'll wrap snip those on. Probably won't do us any good in an arena like this, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll give it a shot. Uh, Brendan Lee, uh, who we can currently see in shot, also getting himself set for another run. Uh, he himself after the disappointment uh, at Jeddah. He hasn't actually enlisted a, a timed lap yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, in a situation where you've got just under nine minutes still to go, and um, you, you've effectively got two runs here at this point, Aiden. Yeah, that doesn't really surprise me because last time at Jeddah, we did see quite a few drivers go for that first lap when they were all kind of like actually dicing around with each other. They were quite fight they were fighting with each other at that, that stage. But we also saw a lot of them just go, cool, I'm going to peel into the pit lane, just do that installation lap, everything's working fine, and, and in we come. So uh, two laps is usual around here. Again, they'd probably be going out around this sort of time, and then they'd be going around again like uh, two minutes 30 for the final lap. Can we all, all probably push it a little bit later to about two minutes because it's such a shorter circuit around here. But uh, Brendan Lee getting that car ready for his hot lap, building up that tire temperature, making sure the batteries, of course, charge. And away he goes through that final corner and heading into the turn one. Hard on the brakes, it will be when he arrives there. And then really ride the inside of that curb. Not too much to unsettle the car because then it's going to throw you out to the sausage curb on the outside. Now arriving on board with you, Lasso, you had a fantastic Q1. He had a fantastic stellar P, uh, Q1, in fact, and uh, coming out of Remus now and hurtling down the back straight. We will have DRS that will take you through towards turn four at Slosh Gold. You need to make sure you take as much curve on the, on the outside before cutting inside out of turn four, and then it's turns five and six at the Roche and Verth curve again, utilizing the curves and cutting down deep to the inside again. Be careful of the gravel. Just licks it a little bit on the front right. Yeah, and that's invalidated the lap time. Again, the white line's perilous here at Spielberg. And even the gravel is sucked him out into there. And sadly, that is the lap done for Alf, uh, for Ulas, uh, sadly. But we saw this last time. The first lap didn't go well. But the second lap, hello. Let's see if he can put it right up at the top of the board once again and get himself into Q3. Because he'll be wanting to bounce back off a poor performance in Jeddah. He knows he can do better than that. And let's see if he can actually put himself at the top this time around. But he's built up the battery. He's just going to go again. Yeah, well, Brendan Lee did exactly that. We saw how close he left the timer to the very last moment. Of course, it was enough to break him into Q2. He was just trying to conserve that energy, trying to build it back up, save the tyres as well. Don't use and abuse them when you don't need to. As now Lucas Blakely makes his way around the final two corners through the Ock and Rink curve. Very fast paced as you electrify up the final two corners here. And the current champion is going to look to enlist to sell a time maybe even to knock Rasmussen off his perch as he makes his way across. He does a 103.057, but it's not over yet. Still plenty of time to go. Yeah, lots of drivers still let, yet to set their fastest lap times. We're watching on board now, and there goes Barry Borrowman right at the top. 
a 0.3. Watching on board with Luke's teammate, Wilson. Can he put himself up to P5, but it's still in that mix, but I'm not too sure whether that's going to be safety for themselves just yet. Alvaro Curaton through the final two turns, rides it right on the white line, comes line, Longe goes fastest into the point twos, and Alvaro Curaton goes into fifth. Now watching on board with Jed Norgrove, who wants to bounce back from that Jeddah qualifying round the final corner across the line, and it is going to be up there in P2, also in the point twos, and there goes Frederick Rasmussen. Are we surprised? You know, we got a little bit hyped. Maybe someone else is going to be there, but of course, Mr. Consistency oh. up in a P1. A little bit of a tank slapper there from Yoni Tormala out of the final corner. Sadly puts him in P10. That is on the cusp. Don't discount Brendan Lee. They're going fourth fastest, but three drivers straight away going for the 102862. So we speak about Jed Norgrove's brilliance around Bahrain. Uh, I tell you what, a surprise package at Alpha Tari, but now enlisting some competitive 102 times. I probably didn't expect to see these as such until the remaining few minutes of the session, but we have got them now. They're alive and kicking, and Yoni Tormala, speaking of alive and kicking, to stay that way, he needs to break out of the bottom five. Yeah, someone else we need to look at. Thomas Ronhart, yet to set a lap time, either. He's, you know what, don't need my warm-up laps. All I need to do is one lap at the end, save my tyres, I'm going to go for it, and I'm going to put it right at the top of the board. Or, potentially, he's been out there and he's uh, got himself invalidated. Yeah, Jake Benham, also in the top ten with his teammate, the Flying Dutchman, Jarno Watmir. Seventh and eighth together, the Mercedes are primed. And uh, something that they're so used to, of course, they uh, generally work together a lot alongside their compatriot, Danny Berejne. And Mercedes have been very active in trying to restore themselves back to the precipice of F1 sim racing action. Of course, champions with Brendan Lee, champions as well with Jarno Watmir. And they'll be looking to take the crown back and to become the first driver as well, Jarno Watmir, to take a title uh, back after losing it for the first time. As now Jake Benham gets himself set, but by the looks of it, going slowly to get him prepped for <laughs> one final run, or whether it's the case he's coming into the pits, not quite sure, but this is the type of thing we saw from Brendan earlier, just energy saving, yep, yep. leaving it to the last minute. Yeah, I think he's just, uh, I think he might have just run out of fuel. They want to yeah. be running the fuel as low as possible so that they have enough for that fast lap. But then yeah. on the cooldown lap, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're out of everybody's way, it's fine. One thing I do love to see is when we see Freddie Rasmussen come into the pits, as soon as he enters that pit lane, he is straight on the race director to look at all the sector times, not just of his own lap, but I'm sure he's also comparing his lap to all of the other drivers to see where they're going quicker and where he thinks that he can potentially top them. Of course, Jake Benham didn't really need to continue on for another lap, really. He had enough time to get back into the pits, reset, get a new fuel load on there, maybe even some fresh tyres mm -hmm. uh, if he has them spare. Uh, Frederick Rasmussen, though, still uh, right at the top of the leaderboard and uh, still quite, uh, you know, a couple of hundreds separating yeah. them, which I think in the context of what we're seeing, Hayden, is, is quite an amount. Yeah, but then they're in the 208. So what do you reckon? Do you reckon they're going to retire from this session now and just say, okay, cool, I think I'm good. I'm going to get into Q3. Or do you think they will either just, you know, be one of the last to cross the line? So you have that option. You can see, mm. oh, okay, I'm, I'm actually safe here now. I can back off and still save, you know, a semi use. Like he's only done a half a lap really of, of pushing. Well, it's, how's your bottle? I suppose, in that <laughs> case, so, I mean, you've got to you've got to be the one to make that really big decision to go out for one final run. In, in which case, you might be you might prefer to save tyres uh, again. Um, but nevertheless, or maybe even just take a break before we head into Q3. But um, still here at this point, Thomas Ronhart still yet to enlist the time on the timing tower. Remains 15th fastest, and will almost surely be out unless he crosses the line with a faster time that puts him in the top 10. So this is a very big moment for Thomas Ronha. Yeah, all eyes are going to be on him right now. And he was one of the strongest qualifiers from last season. Rarely, well, I don't think he ever got knocked out of Q2. He always made it to Q3. One of his lowest qualifying positions is around seventh place. Obviously, Stick Finn Jedder not quite up there, not like the Thomas Ronha we've seen. So is this now that break that we've seen that all the other drivers have now caught up to him and Thomas's pace that he had in Bahrain is just completely wiped out? Or was it just, you know, okay, he's P6 in, in Jeddah, but let's put ourselves back on top. We're going to watch on board now with Thomas Ronha as we start a flying lap here in Austria, around the final corner, down towards the line, and let's get the lap started as we rise up the hill, breaking just after the 100 meter board. Take that inside curb, but don't go over the uh, sausage curb. DRS open, keep it to the right, and then get it back over to the left, just to get that shortest distance and not lose a valuable thousandth of a second. Run either wheel over the curbing 
So you've got your car in the middle. That's going to make it stable, but you're also going to utilize as much of the track as possible to open up that hairpin. DRS open. Sadly, no slipstream for his teammate there as he now heads down into turn four. We saw it earlier. A little bit of a drift through the corner is going to be beneficial. Not quite there for Thomas Ronhard. No real drift through the corner. He had the car very, very stable. Bit of traffic on the left-hand side, but that's not going to disrupt him. Keep the car on the right, then throw it through this fantastic double left-hander. Don't do what Alpi Butcher did and get it caught up in the gravel there. He doesn't. Don't touch that curb on the inside either because it's just going to loosen the car and you're just going to throw all your laps on the way. He's only half a tenth up, but this could be a very, very important lap there for Thomas Ronhard. Don't invalidate now. This is a fantastic lap. Don't throw it all away through the final couple of corners, right on the white line, down towards the line. Where is it going to be? And he puts himself up into P3. And for now, that looks safe. Oh, I tell you what, a clutch lap there from Thomas Ronhar when he needed it the most as well. Ulas Azilder in the Tenacious Turk. He's now currently sat in 15th. The Haas needs something out of this now as he cruises through, turns 9 and 10. The Red Bull Mobile curve with a Haas spinning its wheels up through towards the line. He goes fifth fastest, all but safety for now. Can he hold on though? Here comes Wilson Hughes, the Scotsman. Now looking to lift himself off the bottom. P8, he's in the top 10, not eliminated, at least for now. How about his teammate, Lucas Blakely, current champion, looking to find himself back in the top 10. Can he secure himself a shootout place? He does oh. better than that. A 102, 860. But here comes Jed here, Hayden. Here he comes through the final corner. Jed looked good earlier on in Q2, but can he now confirm that and get himself into safety across the line? It's not an improvement, but it is still P5. It looked like he invalidated on that lap time, sadly. Oh, no, that's his teammate, Yoni Tormala, who is out of this session. He invalidated Alvaro Caraton through the final corner now down towards the line and is he going to get himself into safety no he doesn't out in q2 look to make a mistake heading through the final corner rasmussen goes fastest again with a 102 839 here comes the iranian barry burmans he goes fifth fastest wilson hughes now on the bubble we've got two mercedes on is out of q2 again jake benham his teammate the all-star can he make it into another q3 session makes way towards the line p8 for the all-star jake benham and breaks out of his teammate qualifies higher for the second time running yeah yano Otman two in a row here comes brendan lee round the final corner he's safe at the moment p9 he's going to make himself even more safe with a p5 in that qualifying session but yana Watney, what is going on for him in qualifying we've said it before this qualifying isn't always you know pole position every sort of week or always in that top five and he's always able to come through the field but you know and alfie butcher one of those that's actually one of the shocks of qualifying for me to be fair out in p13 he is one that we always do see up at the front. So it's, uh, yeah, not great the day for uh, Alfie Butcher so far. Yeah, a few shocks there. Uh, I think Jana Watmir, pretty much a carbon copy of what we mm. saw from Jeddah. Uh, Wilson Hughes, very unlucky. Uh, just missing out, barely, uh, with Josh Edo getting through to Q3. Red Bull, again, looking strong. They have got cars both in P1 and at the bottom of the top 10 as well. So they're going to be heading through to Q3. Uh, very well stocked, uh, I think, ready for the final qualifying session. So we will be qualifying, oh, certainly sending it out for a, for a obviously a pole shootout uh, up next, but uh, just to analyze some of those names that we've lost, uh, we've lost Alfie Butcher as well. Another yeah. major shock. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. I, I just completely went under the radar with Alfie Butcher, I guess, because we, we saw the mistake, obviously. He ran it wide, he got invalidated on his lap time, and that unfortunately where it got away from him. And, you know, he's had a fantastic first qualifying session. This one, okay, it's not the greatest, and he is out in Q2, but you know, I, I think he needs to not dwell on that. He's still very new to this experience in LAN. I don't think he needs to get himself inside his head and like, oh, do you know what, I've ruined my day. You've got a great start in Jeddah. And I'm sure he can make some fantastic overtakes here in Austria later on when we go racing. Yeah, and, and Alvaro Caraton, a former pole sitter at this track, losing him to um, Williams not having um, a, a, no, as good a performance no. uh, as they had at Jeddah. Mm. Um, so the wheels sort of falling off here, but <laughs> we, we heard from Ishmael Fassi, he alluded to strategy being key as, as well at this track, so it could be the case we could see some of that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that's what the guys behind the, the desk are going to be sorting out later, and that's why, I mean, we heard from from Jonah Martens uh, at Ferrari when Claire asked him about the strategy. He was like, well, we don't actually know ourselves because you can't really go for what is the perfect strategy because you don't know where your driver is until they actually do qualifying. So then you have to reassess the the strategy to be like, okay, maybe we go longer and we can catch up later on and hold up for a teammate. So we've all got to assess that. But I believe Claire has found somebody else in the studio. So Claire, where are you? I've come down again to Mercedes to speak to Yano again after Q2. In a, in a way, it's a positive because it's such a surprise that we're speaking to you. But that's about the only positive I can give you, I'm afraid. Just talk us through what happened. 
Um, yeah, to be honest, just didn't quite have the pace. I invalidated the last corner as well, which is what got me knocked out. But other than that, we didn't have, or I didn't have much to spare as well. So um, it was a little bit different scenario than Jeddah. Um, luckily, they, those are both tracks. They are quite okay to overtake. So um, that will help. Um, but I hope uh, I will not be P12 anymore in future qualifying and be further up ahead. Yeah, we've got a couple more qualifiers to go over the next few days anyway. Is it something, is it just a few mistakes that you've made? I know you mentioned there was a couple of sector mistakes that you made, but is it is that genuinely what it is? Because we're so it's so surprising to see you out in Q2. Well, there wasn't really any mistakes in my Q2 lap until the last corner. Uh, but even then, I would have only squeezed through by like 100. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's different to Jeddah, yeah. where I actually had the pace to perhaps go for pole. Now we just... I just felt a little bit too slow. So, Like you say, both are really good for overtaking, so I wish you well in the races, and let's see you up at the top. Anyway, back to you guys. Yes, thank you, CC, for that. Obviously, Jano Otmir again, uh, I think resolute, I think, obviously, with where Mercedes are right now. But uh, at the end of the day, we know how good Jano is uh, when it comes to race trim, because, you know, qualifying trim's one thing, race trim's a whole different other matter here, Hayden. Yeah, I mean, never write off Jano Watmir in races, no matter where he starts. Even if he's 20th, even if he's got a lap head start for everybody else, somehow that man works a miracle and finds himself up there. But this is great for Jake Benham, of course, because, you know, he's still very new. This is, he had his first season last season. This is his second season, but he's still inexperienced compared to Jano Watmir. So to be able to beat your teammate, that's obviously going to be a boost for him going into the two races later on. And it's definitely going to, you know, help that confidence going further forward in this qualifying session. Yeah, uh, I mean, Jake Benham, no stranger to top level performances. And uh, again, really coming of age, I think, at Mercedes, where he spent the entirety of his F1 sim racing career so far. And uh, he could be on hand to achieving some really big points for them as well, uh, coming through the course of this week, if he can continues qualifying the way he has done. Uh, Nicholas Longate, who has uh, shown that he has got um, some outrageous pace in his own right. And uh, I think off, off the back of what we've seen between he and Freddie, mm -hmm. um, truly stellar performances, Hayden, so far. Yeah, those are going to be the ones to watch to see at the top of the timing screens uh, at the end of this session. And it's also good for him because, you know, Sally just missing out in Q3 last time around at Jeddah. So for this time around to have both Ferraris in, obviously they're going to be very, very happy for strategy. Looking at the other team's kick, they have two teams in. Red Bull have two, t uh, two drivers in for this session, but all the other teams only have one driver. So they're all going to be putting their focus on those guys at the moment. Nicholas Longay on a lap. It would be interesting to see whether he had tyres saved as well, uh, but it looks like he's going to bail out of that one. Yes, he does. So he's just utilising some softer, uh, some older soft tyres just to make sure everything's working. Just get your eye in ready for two flying laps here in Austria. We've also got Jake Benham, who is out on track, uh, doing a lap at the moment. Thomas Ronhar on an outlap, Barry Borman on an outlap. But uh, yeah, here comes Jake Benham once again, just like Longay did, just doing that installation lap, just making sure everything's working okay, and then coming back into the pit. Yeah, the MG light flashing on the rear of the Mercedes. Yulash Zilderim, not concerned with such matters. He's going to complete a flying lap here. Of course, a reduced time in the session as it continues to make its way through queues one, two, and three. Uh, this time, only the small matter of 10 minutes at hand here for the drivers. This time, though, eight minutes and 20 to go. So it's all down to Yulash. Obviously, once setting this lap in place as he makes his way up through towards turn three at Remus Curve, you just see him there hugging that inside line and uh, immediately putting the power back down again as he opens up the rear wing with DRS applied, heading down through towards turn two. Again, he's going to be heavy coming onto the brakes, but needs to be cautious to the curbs as he makes his way down to the in-swinger at turn four out of slosh goal. The question is, will this be a golden lap time to kick things off for him in this session? There we can see his camera on the bottom right. Has, of course, enjoying the plaudits in F1 Esports of building brand new stars for the future. Thomas Ronhar was one of them last season, if we look back after his stellar performance and taking victories the way he did. Finished P3 in the championship last season. Yulas Azildrim, as well as Alfie Butcher, will be looking for similar results. As now Azildrim makes his way through the final corner out of turn 10. Breathes a sigh of relief as he makes his way across the line. Track limit's not an issue, but a 103.2 is a nice way to start as we make our way through Q3. Certainly, it's going to be interesting to see for him because we saw him invalidate his first lap, both qualifying sessions we've had so far, and then get into the next session with that final lap. So, you know, maybe this is the wrong way to go. He needs to invalidate on the first one, and then he's flying on the second one. But uh, a good start so far. Obviously, that's not going to be the time that is going to be representative later on because we were seeing drivers into the, the 0 0.2.8. So a point... 3-2 is definitely not going to be up there, but it's just good to get your eye in and sort of, you know, make sure you're still in that groove. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, Thomas Ronha, who was at Haas last season, we alluded to his form there, uh, now here this time with Kick F1 Sim Racing. Uh, last round at uh, Bahrain, where we had that, well, the first round we had at Bahrain, where he would go on to take victory after taking pole. I'd like to add another pole to his list too. Let's see where he finishes here. Will it be above you, Lass? It certainly will be. A 102.8, leaving nothing to chance here at the start of the session. So already, Pulling out the big guns, Hayden. You know all about the big guns. We call it Big Guns Gullis, don't we? <laughs> oh, there he is. Uh, 2.8. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Uh, absolutely fantastic lap. And I spy some new tyres there for Thomas Ronhard because he's put himself right up at the front. It'd be interesting to see what Barry does as he comes across the line. Just a 3.0. So probably another driver that is on used tyres. Brendan Lee was right on the edge there of uh, invalidating his lap time. I think he just about hold it, but I don't know whether he just dipped a tyre into the gravel, which might have just lost some time. And then again, just touching the gravel once again on the exit of that corner. He might just get away with it the way the physics of the game works as he heads through into the final couple of corners now. Brendan Lee has been one of those drivers that has been fighting to try and get through the next session right at the end uh, of each of the sessions that we've had so far. So I don't think he's got new tyres on the car, but he'll come across the line. And uh, yes, a 3.5, not going to be a representative lap time later. But Lucas Blakely, oh, oh no. Josh Edu. He, he do he, he do be off the track. He do be off the track, Aiden Gullis. And unfortunately, a key mistake. And again, at that vicious turns nine and ten, and uh, it's cost him uh, essentially a banker lap to at least lay down. And now it's going to be pressure. It's going to be a high, pre high yeah. pressurized cooker now for uh, Josh Edo. Uh, Jake Benham still yet to cross the line to finish another lap or his first lap here in this session. There he is at the top of Remus Corner. He's got a little bit of traffic ahead of him, but DRS open here for the All-Star as he now makes his way down through towards turn four. You'll now try and hook this one out, keep it tight down the inside once again. Of course, trying to bring something to the Mercedes camp. Obviously, Jana Watmir will be looking to try and extract as much as he can during the race. It's down to Benham to unleash something extraordinary through qualifying trim. Just see him there using all the track coming out of turns five and six. And now through towards the Jochenring curve here once again. He's going to try and leave it in deep, breaking at the 50 mark as he cuts in. Just a quick downshift, a stab on the brakes. Maybe not even that. Coming through turn 10. Oh. Well, Benham, goodness me, an invalidation through the final sector at the final corner. The pressure now on Edo and Benham. Potentially as well, because I was speaking to him after the Jeddah lap, and he said to me that he was on for pole. He had a lap that was good for pole. Now, I'm sure if I went and spoke to every driver that was in Q3, they would all say to me, yeah, my lap time was on for pole bar this one error. But uh, yeah, maybe he just, you know, he needs to just iron out that mistake right at the last minute. He potentially could have had his eye on the Delta, be like, I'm on a really good lap time here. And then just that one little mistake because you're a little bit too over eager or maybe he was chasing lap time around. There. I want to bring it back to that Josh Edu incident because it's very strange to see him so far out wide in that gravel at that section. If you're running it wide, if you just made a mistake, and you've drifted out wide, you've got a lot of runoff areas. So I'm sure that he's maybe just thrown it into that second to last corner, lost the rear end, caught it, and then that's thrown him out left over to that gravel trap on the outside. There's a vicious curve down that inside though, isn't there? Mm. Heading through Rint. Uh, I mean, where you, where you get to the inside, obviously you want to take it as tight as you can, but if yeah. you go too far, it can really unsettle yes. your car. So I would agree with you in the sense, I think that it has definitely sent him out wide. I mean, that's the portion of track that we're talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, and it, it's a constant theme. We saw it with Fassi earlier on bone of contention for many a driver and it will be a feature to watch during the race as well. Yeah, especially the last two corners, like it is vital that you get them right and you don't invalidate. But as I said about looking at your lap time, whether you're up or you're down, it's going to be important. If you're already up, you're going to be looking at it and you know, you don't want to be cautious because you're going to lose lap time. So you have to still be on the limit, but you can sometimes get yourself in your own head to be, oh, I'm up at the moment, so I need to, I need to oversend it or, or, or whatever. And sadly, that seems to be what we're, we're, we're seeing at the moment between these guys. But they're just, a few of them just taking a rest. There's a couple of cars out on track at the moment, setting themselves out of the river. And as I said, about two minutes is the latest time you want to get out on track uh, to go for a run. Obviously, we are going to see all drivers out on track. Nobody's going to be just staying in the pit lane this time around. We've already got, First, uh, Brendan. Uh, yeah, Brendan Lee out on track. Ulas out on track as well, and Lucas Blakely. Yeah, uh, so two former champions uh, now, well, one reigning champion uh, out on track. Brendan Lee now making his way down through towards Slosh Gold. He's going to be one of the first to cross the line should it remain like this. And uh, obviously, Ulas Rizildrim, who I must say is taken uh, to F1 sim racing like a duck to water. No stranger to LAN events, though. And like I said, he's competed uh, in GT3 racing categories and trying to utilize that LAN experience here in the world of Formula One. And there is Brendan Lee. 
looking onwards as he looks to get himself psyched. We saw him pull off a sensational clutch lap in Q1 uh, when he was trying to ERS save. And uh, at the same time, after invalidating that previous lap, or at least not happy or content with the time he laid down, but he came back fighting and it's brought him a place in Q3. Yeah, so it's going to be all up to Brendan Lee here because he's got nobody ahead of him, no slipstream. Although, there goes Ulas to just get in front. He wants to get a move on with this qualifying session. He wants to get this lap in straight away. Uh, but for Brendan Lee, there's no one who's going to be coming out the pit lane because it'd be great if you can time it perfectly. But there's a car that comes out the pit lane. You get a fantastic slipstream as you go down in towards turn two and turn three. And that can gain you some valuable attempts of a second. Uh, but there's Brendan Lee just, you know, Warming up those tyres, get himself ready. But Ulas wanted to get this qualifying back underway. And here he is heading down into the first corner. He's a little bit up, two, three, five hundred seconds. Just watch that time rise. So you can clearly see that he made a mistake on his best lap so far through turn one. Eight hundredths of a second he is currently up as he heads into the second and third corners. A little bit of a drift through the corner and then loses so much time. He was wide of the apex. Missed that you want to be as close to that yellow sausage curve on the inside. He's got 33 seconds left on the clock, 50 seconds left on the clock. Might just make it. Yeah, it's going to be tough though because he's going to be like basically spending all that ERS uh, energy. He's, he's still got a lot. Through. He's got 87% still, so he doesn't need to build up too much in all fairness to him. But still needs to remain cautious about getting around the track before the time it ticks to zero. And bear in mind, we've got more cars coming up behind, so this could be a very fraught situation. We did see Lucas Blakely just in behind him too. He's making his way around turn four. Can you last make it around in time to go again? Basically doing exactly what Brendan did in Q1. As we now wait and see, the Turk now makes his way through towards the next right-hander, keeps it tight to the inside, using all the curbs on the outset of turn 10, and then heading through down this long straight. DRS now opens up here as he makes his way up towards turn one. Ulas has a chance. Yeah, watch out for the other drivers coming through, though. We've got Lucas Blakely. He's going to be one of the first runners to set a lap time here at the end of Q3. Yeah, Lucas Blakely up towards the line now. Can he top a Ron Haar? Remains third fastest, no improvement, but the well, two-time world champion Brendan Lee. Can he topple his own teammate up at the front? We'll wait and see. He goes third fastest. Here comes Rasmussen. Can Red Bull go to the front? Oh, it's a blistering 102. 761. Here comes Barry Oak. Sensational. A 102. 744. The same protagonist. Red Bull, two and three. Yeah, Josh Hedo put himself up there. And Jed Norgrove, the Red Bull family. Doing great here at Austria. Two, three, and four. Thomas Ronhaar still yet to the lap. We've got Ulas and Jake Benham also out on track at the moment. Here comes Jake Benham through the final corner. Let's not invalidate this time, Jake. He does it, but he doesn't get right up to the white line, as maybe some of the others do. It's P7. That is a strong qualifying session for him. He'll be happy with that. Thomas oh! Ronhaar, though, puts it on provisional pole position. Only one driver can topple him, Ulas. And we'll have to wait and see whether he's crossed the line. No, he hasn't. He's already finished P9 for you last. So there we go. Thomas Ronha is on pole for our race later at Austria. Truly electric scenes here. Thomas Ronha doing the unthinkable topping. What was a stellar Barry Burman lap? Five thousand folks of a second between Ooh. them. Truly outrageous. Freddie Rasmussen in third place. Just look at that top four. Jed Norgrove. This pace is incredible from a young man who blew the world apart back at Bahrain. 93 thousandths from the top. Josh Edo, Longe Benham, Brendan Lee, Ulas Azildarim and Lucas Blakely in P10 Hayden. Good recovery there from Josh Edo after making that mistake earlier on in Q3 to then recover it and still put himself into P5. And as I said, the Red Bull family running very strongly. Freddie Rasmussen, Mr. Consistency, up there in P3. Jed Norgrove in P4. And I believe Claire is talking to our pole position man. Well, Thomas, that was incredible. Just at the last moment you beat Ferrari. I mean, just talk us through. Did you did you think, did you feel it in that last lap you did? Yeah, especially, you know, in towards the last lap was P1. So that was a little bit of a confident boost to, you know, push for the final lap. Uh, very happy to take pole. I uh, wasn't sure about the last set because I really had to push because I was down on Barry on the split. But uh, yeah, very happy to take P1. I mean, we heard what it meant to Barry to lose that pole position. I'm sure you probably heard it through your noise cancelling headphones. Uh, what does it mean to you to get pole position round here? You're already leading the championship. It puts you in a brilliant position ahead of the Austria race. Yeah, you know, the BP1 Austria, of course, there's many overtake opportunities, so it might not mean the world, but of course, an extra point, so that's always good to have. Uh, heading towards the race, uh, it's going to be chaos, like I said. Uh, many, many things will happen. Uh, should be a good one, and uh, yeah, let's see uh, how it goes. We were speaking to Lucas Blakely earlier and he said Austria is always quite chaotic. Is, 
is it a case of just staying out of damage and making sure you keep your nose in front? That's one of them, yes, yeah, staying out of damage. Uh, having a good strategy definitely helps. Um, track position doesn't really matter too much around here, so many strategies can work, undercuts, overcuts, so you'll see many different strategies can work. Um, yeah, I'll keep that secret for now, and uh, <laughs> let's see what happens. I always try and get the secrets out. Uh, well, for now, congratulations to your pole position man for Austria, Thomas Ronha. Wow. There we have it. <laughs> that was quite something, wasn't it? That was ooh, exciting to the very last second. But it's Thomas Ronhai takes pole position. What do you make of that? Yeah, strong qualifying performance from him. P6 in Jeddah. We thought maybe the rest of the field have caught up to him and it's going to be a very close competition. But yeah, Thomas Ronhai puts it back on pole position, puts himself back. Obviously, you know, we haven't had the races yet. He is still the championship leader. And he's going to add another point to his name as well to put himself on 27. Absolutely, those points for pole position as well. Barry, let's talk about him. P2 in both qualifying sessions. When I spoke to him after qualifying for Jeddah earlier, he said he'd be happy if he got P2 again, but I think he would have <laughs> liked pole there. How vital is five thousandths of a second? I mean, that is incredible. Uh, I mean, I, I can understand his frustration, first and foremost. I, I mean, his lap was sensational. To topple Freddie the way he did, Yeah. Uh, astounding. Uh, and we know what Freddie's like around here. Uh, I mean, second place over the last four races we have had at this track. Uh, but Barry Burramand, uh, there's Rasmussen going across the line, that 7-6-1. Uh, he managed to enlist Barry immediately to sending it to the top, uh, but just could not stop the relentless Thomas Ronha. He hasn't missed a beat since Bahrain. He really hasn't. He's definitely got some momentum behind him. Freddie Rasmussen, let's talk about him a little bit as well. Provisional pole at a point, but wasn't meant to be, but still looking strong. Mm. Consistency, as I said, is very, very important in this event because we've got so many races and he is showing that once again. He's at the top, he's in the top three. The strategy for this race is going to mean that it's going to be maybe a little bit more chaotic. Being at the front doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be in that DRS train where everybody's just sat behind each other and nobody's really overtaking. We are going to have a few overtakes. We are going to have positions changing. So to put yourself at the front is going to be as beneficial as possible. But yeah, you're going to want that pole position because it, it gives you an extra point and that can be the difference between first and second at the end of this championship. Absolutely. Freddie would have wanted that pole position, as would Barry. And Claire is with Barry right now. Claire, take it away. Well, Barry, congratulations, because it's still a very good starting position for both qualifying sessions. But we heard the frustration. We had to bleep out the words we didn't. But we heard how frustrated you were just at that last moment. Thomas Ronha beat you to it. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, sorry. You can take the mic if you want. No, You're going to start I, singing. I, I <laughs> no, but like, yeah, first of all, again, hello to, um, to everyone who's watching. But yeah, I mean, um, I said it um, last time after I got P2 in Jeddah. I said I would take P2 happily for Austria and luckily it happened. But yeah, I mean, in that heat moment, uh, of course, I wanted to get Paul because with Thomas and Freddy, <laughs> we had like so many stories. Yeah. Even last year, every time I did a good lap, I think they beat it by like uh, such a little margin, but it's still, um, yeah, I am. I need to think and P2, I will absolutely take it. It was amazing quality from my side. Like, I'm actually super happy with the qualities in the in these two tracks, P2, P2. It's it's amazing. I'm just looking forward to the race now, and also, yeah, my teammate was on. I think on a pole lap as well, and then he just invalidation in the penultimate corner. I believe happens. You know. We are always uh, pushing to the limit and it could happen. But still, I will take it. P2 and P6, really good starting position for the team. And I think we can just work on it and uh, let's see what we can do. And also with Austria, because obviously it's a short lap, but you do have a really good place to start looking for overtaking. Is, is it a track that kind of uh, suits F1 sim racing to overtake? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you ask like any driver, they will also tell you Austria is one of the track that everyone are scared of. You know why? Because in turn four, in the turn three, turn three the yeah, yeah, turn three on the top, everyone gonna be stuck with each other, and if you break a little bit later, you're getting wing damage, and it's gonna be like one of the, it's gonna be chaos race. Uh, to be honest, Austria, like Austria, is one of the places that quality maybe any top 10 is could be the same not really the same but you can literally win from any position on the grid so yeah as i said i just need to keep myself cool calm uh, i'm gonna speak with the team what strategy we're gonna do uh, but i'm really looking forward to it and it's my uh, first time doing lan and uh, i'm actually i was a little bit nervous before today you know it's 
like it's my first time, but I'm really happy with myself. Really try managing the nerves and everything really good yet. So I'm really happy with it. I'm looking forward to the race. Well, you should be very pleased with yourself. Two second places, and like you say, had nerves coming into it. Um, but you are today the bridesmaid, not the bride. But let's see if you can get that win. Over to you guys. Wow, Barry sounding very happy there, very positive. Uh, sounds like he's having a lovely time, which is exactly what we want to hear. We're having a lovely time too. Uh, one thing that I do want to pick up with uh, with you guys is invalidation. Mm -hmm. Lots of that in that qualifying session there. So tricky, so disappointing, right? Yeah, but it's just so easy to do because it's just such fine margins. You know, you've got that white line that dictates the track. No one can complain about that because it's a fair playing field for everybody. But if you're one millimeter the other side, it's game over for you. And you're just carrying so much speed through those last two corners. And you're trying to carry the maximum speed through those two corners that just a little bit too much is going to understeer you. It's going to push you out there and it's, it's all over. It is indeed. We saw Josh also having a moment coming off track as well. But good redemption for him to manage to get back up to P5 in qualifying. Yeah, that was huge. Uh, I think we, me and Hayden obviously alluded <laughs> to it during the show. Um, Simon just... Walking by. Uh, yeah, just having a wonder. Uh, the virtual paddock is busy here. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got this moment as well from Ulash and Zildrim talking about mm. track limits. Uh, I mean, this was a huge point too. Um, I mean, Ulash making a, a bit of a mistake heading up through turn three. It's so key to hook that up. Uh, I think he missed the apex just slightly uh, coming out of that portion. And, and again, it just goes to show how vital it is to hook up the perfect lap around such a short circuit. Uh, going back to what you said about Josh, I think, again, we looked at that understeer moment um, that we saw in Q1, a few drivers making those errors, Josh making that mistake. Mm. Um, and, he, and he did pay, at the, at the time I thought he paid the price, but then coming back and recovering the way he did, uh, I mean, yeah. this is the moment. And, and yeah, uh, it's never a nice place to be, but credit to him for coming back and, and still managing to go P5. Absolutely. Right, guys, let's have a little look at our standings. Updated, of course, as we've mentioned, pole position gaining a point. Who's going to talk us through? Well, we've got Thomas Von Hart gains an extra point there, puts him on to 27, extends that lead over Jano Watmir to nine points now. And of course, Freddie Rasmussen picked up the one earlier on in Jeddah, puts himself to P13. No real other changes amongst the rest of the grid because, of course, we're going to have to wait for that when we go racing later on. And some of those guys who are going to be looking forward to those races and getting themselves further up the field, of course, Lucas Blakely uh, and Brendan Lee, former champions who are still on zero points at the moment. They are indeed. Now, let's have a look at the constructors, shall we, George? Yeah, the team's championship looks a little bit like this. Now we're separating the top three a little mm -hmm. bit. We've got 27 points going to kick F1 Sim Racing team, that vital pole position point that has now pushed them ahead of Ferrari, ahead of Barry Burman. Quite a contentious battle there. Thomas Ronhard doing enough. Uh, Oracle Sim, Red Bull Sim Racing down in fourth with 14 points. I'm suspecting more to come there. Very impressed with Jed Norgrove to qualify fourth fastest. Watch out for them in the race for Scuderia Alfa Tauri. There we have it. That is our standings after qualifying for both Jeddah and the Red Bull Ring in Spielberg. Oh, it's been <laughs> quite full on, hasn't it? It has it been is. quite full on. That is two qualifying sessions done, the first two qualifying sessions of the event two. And now we have a breather. The drivers are all having a little chat, having a moment. And now it is time to gear up and get ready for where the big points come. We are going to have a break, and when we come back, we go racing. George, Hayden, and Claire, thank you so much for being with me through those two qualifying sessions. Now it is time to have a break before we come back for the big ones. We will be racing in Jeddah and Spielberg. When we come back, make sure you join us.